is all. Commissioner, over the past two weeks, uh, we have heard evidence of misconduct and of conduct that falls below community standards and expectations in relation to life insurance and general insurance. In this closing address, we'll deal with each of the case studies that has been the subject of evidence in turn, with the exception of the final two case studies relating to the regulation of the insurance industry. For each of these case studies, we will identify the findings that we regard as being open on the evidence. Next week, we will publish a document containing the questions that arise from the case studies and the other evidence tendered in these hearings. Um, we, plan to uh, we plan to publish that document next Friday, the 28th of September. The first case study examined in these hearings involved Clearview Life Assurance Limited, which I will refer to as Clearview, in relation to the direct sale of life insurance. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Gregory Martin, the Chief Actuary and Chief Risk Officer of Clearview Wealth Limited. Prior to 2011, Clearview operated as a captive insurer, selling life insurance products to customers of the corporate group of which it formed part, most recently, Bupa. By 2013, Clearview had expanded into a more substantial and professional direct life insurance business, in the words uh, of Mr Martin, and was selling policies to non-Bupa sourced customers. At that time, Clearview established a sales centre in Parramatta. In 2014, Clearview expanded its direct life insurance operations by investing in an outsourced Melbourne-based sales centre called Your Insure. Clearview closed this business in late 2015. In late 2015 to 16, Clearview made changes to its business to target a more preferred mix of customers which Mr Martin accepted essentially equated to more affluent customers. By mid-2016, Clearview planned to revise its operating model by moving from a high volume, low value model involving emotional sales pitches and above market pricing to a lower volume, higher value model in which products were to be sold with both an emotional and rational pitch at market price. Mr Martin accepted that for the period that Clearview was operating under the former model, the life insurance products that it sold in its outbound telephone sales were more expensive and of lower value than the products they were selling to more affluent people through other channels. Clearview ceased direct sales of life insurance in mid-2017 for reasons that we'll come to. For the period that Clearview was directly selling life insurance, Clearview sold a range of life insurance products through outbound telephone sales, including life cover, trauma cover, funeral cover and accidental death cover. Clearview continues to sell a number of similar products through its retail channel. One of the products that was sold by Clearview's direct life insurance business and which continues to be sold through its retail channel is accidental death cover. Accidental death policies pay out upon a person's death where that death is due to an accident. Clearview's practice in its advisor sales channel has been to always offer an accidental death policy to a customer whose application for life cover has been declined for medical reasons. Mr Martin said that he was aware of ASIC's view that accidental death policies offer a very limited benefit to consumers. Mr Martin accepted that the number of claims made under Clearview accidental death policies was low compared to the number of policies sold. He also accepted that the claims ratio for accidental death policies was lower than for other products. The ratio of claims paid out to premiums collected over the last five years was 26%. And in 2014, the ratio was 1%. In response to a question about whether Clearview would continue to sell such products in light of ASIC's views, Mr Martin said that Clearview had not yet reached a position on this, but that if ASIC and society would like Clearview to stop offering the product, it would do so. 
The Commission heard that in April 2016, ASIC raised concerns with Clearview about unsolicited telephone sales in breach of the requirements of the Corporations Act. ASIC's concerns related to whether Clearview's sales were properly characterised as solicited or unsolicited sales, and if the latter, whether they met the requirements in section 992A3 of the Corporations Act, which is frequently referred to as the anti-hawking provision. By early May 2017, Clearview estimated that it had breached the anti-hawking provision, a criminal offence provision, somewhere between 300,000 and 303,000 times. Mr Martin accepted that by February 2017, there were concerns within the Clearview Direct business both about breaches of the anti-hawking provisions and about the way that those breaches were being escalated and responded to within the organisation. The breaches were not being treated as material matters that required escalation and consideration. In the course of engaging with ASIC about the anti-hawking issues, in March 2017, ASIC also raised concerns with Clearview about pressure selling and mis-selling conduct. After reviewing the transcripts of 42 sales calls from the second half of 2015, ASIC formed the view that Clearview's sales practices may be unfair or manipulative and may pressure consumers to purchase a policy. Mr Martin accepted that these calls involved highly problematic sales practices and that some involved misleading and deceptive conduct and unconscionable conduct. The problematic sales practices recognised by ASIC and Mr Martin included, but were not limited to, misrepresentations about what customers were committing to purchase, misrepresentations or omissions about payment arrangements, including by not explaining to customers precisely when their first premium would be due, and failing to quote prices aligned with the frequency with which premiums would be deducted, so as to underemphasize the extent of the customer's financial liability. There were also other forms of misrepresentation, including that a customer's premiums would never go up with age, despite Clearview retaining the right to unilaterally vary premiums, and about the terms or application of the policies. Sales agents also continued to attempt to sell policies, despite a customer indicating that they wished to read over Clearview's documentation or consult with a partner or friend. Mr Martin accepted that this was done because Clearview Direct did not want to give people time to reflect upon their purchase because they might then decide that they did not want or need the product. The problematic sales practices also included sales agents collecting customers' personal information, including bank details, before customers had confirmed their agreement to proceed with the purchase. Mr Martin accepted that the issues identified in the 42 calls were representative of what he termed almost endemic compliance issues within Clearview Direct for a number of years. Clearview continued to struggle with such issues in 2016 and 17 during its engagement with ASIC. As at February 2017, one quarter of all monitored calls by Clearview sales agents involved a breach. Mr Martin agreed that this was completely unacceptable. Mr Martin accepted that there were at least three causes of the systemic compliance issues. The first was Clearview's remuneration structure. Mr Martin accepted that Clearview's commission structure was a contributor to inappropriate behaviour as it incentivised aggressive sales tactics with the aim of making as many sales as possible at whatever cost. The second was a culture within Clearview Direct that tolerated aggressive sales tactics at the cost of compliance. This was apparent in Clearview's training practices. Mr Martin accepted that sales agents were trained to engage in unfair sales practices, including through aggressive objection handling approaches. The overarching theme was a sell-at-all-costs approach, which Mr Martin accepted was reflective of Clearview Direct's broader culture. 
The prioritisation of sales over compliance was also evident in communications relating to at least one proposed incentives program, which the head of direct sales considered was necessary to stimulate the team and revive the cultural pulse, and which he proposed badging as a training and education trip in order to circumvent the conflicted remuneration provisions. Uh, the third cause of the systemic compliance issues accepted by Mr Martin was large-scale deficiencies in Clearview Direct's quality assurance and compliance program. As just one example, of the 42 calls provided to ASIC, only 10 had been previously reviewed by Clearview's quality assurance team and only a small number of those had failed that process. Mr Martin accepted that when the legal team subsequently reviewed those calls, they had taken a different view. More broadly, Mr Martin accepted that there was insufficient division between Clearview's sales team and its quality assurance function, and that there was a lack of specific legal and compliance experience, particularly in the direct business. The Commission heard that Clearview and ASIC had negotiated terms by which ASIC's investigation into the anti-hawking and mis-selling issues would be resolved. These terms required Clearview to undertake a remediation program in respect of over 32,000 policies sold between 2014 and mid-2017. Most customers are required to opt in to the program and only a small number of customers will be entitled to a full refund of premiums paid. Clearview also agreed to inform ASIC if it decided to recommence selling through the direct channel. Clearview said that it had no present intention of doing so. Mr Martin said it was difficult to understand how an insurer could sell life insurance in outbound sales calls in a way that was both financially viable and legally compliant. He told the Commission that ASIC had not indicated whether it would take any further action in respect of Clearview's 300,000 odd breaches of the anti-hawking provisions or the unconscionable conduct or the misleading or deceptive conduct engaged in by its sales agents. On the evidence, it is open to find that Clearview engaged in misconduct in the following respects, each of which was accepted by Mr Martin. First, Clearview breached the prohibition on the hawking of financial products contained in section 992A of the Corporations Act between 300,000 and 303,000 times between early 2014 and mid-2017. Second, in the calls in which Clearview representatives missold insurance policies between 2013 and 2016, Clearview breached the prohibition on unconscionable conduct contained in sections 12CA and 12CB of the ASIC Act by pressuring individuals to purchase policies, breached the prohibition on misleading or deceptive conduct contained in section 12DA of the ASIC Act by misrepresenting matters such as whether customers were committing to purchase an insurance policy and the terms of those policies, and breached its duty to act towards its policyholders with utmost good faith, as required by Section 13 of the Insurance Contracts Act. Third, Clearview contravened the obligation contained in Section 912A 1A of the Corporations Act to do all things necessary to ensure that the financial services covered by its Australian Financial Services Licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Clearview's systemic failures in its sales processes meant that policyholders were frequently being sold policies in circumstances where Clearview was not behaving honestly or fairly. Fourth, Clearview failed to ensure that its representatives were adequately trained to provide the financial services covered by its financial services licence in contravention of section 912A1F of the Corporations Act. Clearview sales agents were encouraged to sell aggressively, to sign up customers immediately, and to use other inappropriate methods of obtaining sales. Fifth, 
Clearview failed to take reasonable steps to ensure that its representatives complied with the financial services laws in contravention of section 912A1CA of the Corporations Act. Amongst other things, Clearview had inadequate training, quality assurance and compliance processes to ensure that its representatives complied with financial services laws. Sixth, Clearview failed to have in place adequate arrangements for the management of the conflict of interest that it created between the interests of its employees and the interests of its customers in contravention of section 912A1AA of the Corporations Act. The remuneration and incentive structures that Clearview had in place encouraged its sales agents to make as many sales as possible, frequently to the detriment of customers' best interests. On the evidence, it is also open to find that Clearview may have engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. First, Clearview failed to take speedy and effective action to address substantial compliance issues when they became apparent. As we've mentioned, Mr Martin's evidence was that the compliance issues that were identified in the 42 calls provided to ASIC were almost endemic within Clearview Direct sales processes for a number of years. Second, Clearview failed to take meaningful steps to address defects in its quality assurance processes after becoming aware that they were ineffective because agents who had not been flagged for a review felt some sort of immunity. Despite Clearview having decided to move towards monitoring 100% of sales calls, it did not execute that decision because it was moving towards a decision to shut down the business. The upshot of this was that Clearview appears to have permitted its sales agents to continue to engage in problematic sales practices for about a year in circumstances where it had concerns about the effectiveness of its compliance system. On the evidence, it's open to find that the misconduct and the conduct that fell below community standards and expectations may be attributed to Clearview's culture and governance practices, its risk management practices and its remuneration practices. In relation to culture and governance practices, the evidence given by Mr Martin indicates that there were substantial and insurmountable cultural problems within Clearview Direct. As we've indicated, Mr Martin's evidence was that there was a culture within Clearview Direct that tolerated aggressive sales tactics at the cost of compliance and that the management of Clearview Direct did not treat compliance issues such as the breaches of the anti-hawking provisions as matters that required consideration and escalation. In relation to risk management practices, the evidence indicated that the quality assurance program within Clearview Direct was seriously inadequate as its staff lacked qualifications, experience, supervision and resources. In relation to remuneration practices, Mr Martin accepted that the remuneration and incentive structures that Clearview Direct had in place encouraged sales agents to make as many sales as possible, sometimes at the expense of customers' best interests. The second case study concerned Freedom Insurance Group, a company which markets and distributes a range of life insurance products directly to consumers by telephone. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Craig Orton, Freedom's Chief Operating Officer. The Commission also heard evidence from Mr Bruce Stewart, whose son was sold an insurance policy by Freedom in June 2016. At 3pm on the day before Mr Orton was to give evidence, Freedom notified the Commission of substantial changes to its business model. Freedom told the Commission that it intended to cease selling all insurance products except funeral insurance and loan protection cover through outbound sales calls. While Mr Orton accepted that this was a significant change to Freedom's business model, Freedom was not able to produce any documents which directly recorded these decisions. Mr Stewart told the Commission that his son was born with Down syndrome. While Mr Stewart's son has a degree of independence, 
He has difficulties with understanding whether a product is expensive or cheap and whether he has enough money to make purchases. As a result, Mr Stewart and his wife assist their son to manage his finances. In 2016, when Mr Stewart's son was sold insurance by Freedom, his only source of income was the disability support pension. Mr Stewart learnt that his son had taken out insurance after his son received a letter from Freedom. The letter said that Mr Stewart's son had taken out a Freedom Protection Plan which comprised three types of cover, funeral cover, accidental death cover and accidental injury cover. The letter said that premiums for the funeral cover would not be due for 12 months but that premiums for the accidental death and accidental injury cover would be due 12 days later. Mr Stewart told the Commission that he was flummoxed by the letter. He did not understand how or why his son had been signed up, so he asked his son what had happened. Mr Stewart's son remembered speaking to someone on the phone and providing that person with his debit card details, but could not explain why he had done so. Mr Stewart did not think that his son understood that he had provided those details in order to purchase an insurance policy. The following day, Mr Stewart telephoned Freedom and attempted to cancel the insurance on his son's behalf. Mr Stewart was not able to do so. Instead, a Freedom representative told Mr Stewart that they would listen to a recording of the call in which Mr Stewart's son was sold the insurance and then call Mr Stewart back. The representative also told Mr Stewart that the sales agent who sold the insurance to his son probably did not know that his son had a disability. Mr Stewart did not receive a call back from Freedom or a response to an email that he sent to Freedom's head of operations lodging a formal complaint. Two days later, he telephoned Freedom again. During this second phone call to Freedom, Mr Stewart and his son were transferred to Freedom's retention team. The retention agent tried to explain the potential benefits of the insurance for Mr Stewart's son and emphasised multiple times that the policy was free for the first 12 months. The retention agent also said that there was no reason for Freedom to have known that Mr Stewart's son had a disability. However, the retention agent ultimately agreed to cancel the plan. Mr Stewart's son was asked to confirm that he wished to terminate the policy. Mr Stewart's son had great difficulty articulating those words. After the phone call, the retention agent engaged in an instant messenger conversation with another Freedom employee in which disparaging remarks were made about Mr Stewart and his son. Mr Orton accepted that this conduct was totally inappropriate. During the call in which the plan was cancelled, Mr Stewart asked Freedom to provide him with copies of the recordings of the calls in which his son had been sold the insurance. Mr Stewart did not receive those recordings until August this year. Excerpts of two of those calls were played in the course of Mr Stewart's evidence. In the first call, which lasted for just over two minutes, a Freedom sales agent asked Mr Stewart's son whether his mother was at home and discontinued the call when he determined that she was not. In the second call, which took place two days later and which lasted for 18 and a half minutes, the same sales agent sold the policies to Mr Stewart's son. Mr Stewart told the Commission that having listened to that call, he did not think that his son had any understanding of what he was signing up for. Mr Orton accepted that the sales agent's actions were inappropriate and that the sales agent should have known that Mr Stewart's son was not capable of understanding what was occurring in the call. Mr Orton said that the sales agent who sold the policies had engaged in deeply troubling conduct. The way in which Freedom treated Mr Stewart's son was only one example of a broader pattern of inappropriate dealings with vulnerable customers. In its submission to the Commission, Freedom acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in respect of its treatment of at least six other vulnerable customers. 
These instances related to conduct both before and after the introduction of Freedom's vulnerable customer training in February 2017. The most recent complaint was received by Freedom in late April this year. The week before Mr Orton gave evidence, Freedom filed a breach report with ASIC, which related in part to the complaints that Freedom had received in relation to its treatment of vulnerable customers. Freedom told ASIC that when taken together, the conduct of its sales agents in connection with those sales may have breached several aspects of section 912A of the Corporations Act. When asked about the causes of these problems, Mr Orton referred to insufficient quality assurance coverage for calls made by Freedom Insurance representatives. The breach report filed by ASIC also linked Freedom's remuneration structures with its mis-selling to vulnerable customers. Before turning to the remuneration and quality assurance structures, we'll say something about Freedom's sale of accidental death and accidental injury products, which, as you've heard, were sold to Mr Stewart's son. As we've indicated, on the day before Mr Orton gave evidence, Freedom told the Commission that it had ceased the outbound sale of those products. The products will still be sold by Freedom's website and will still be offered to customers if they request them. In his statement, Mr Orton had suggested that accidental death cover combined with an accidental injury rider provides a relatively low cost alternative insurance benefit to full life cover. In his oral evidence, Mr Orton conceded that these types of cover are not a true alternative to life cover because the circumstances in which a person can make a claim on these policies are much more limited than under a life insurance policy. Despite this, Freedom engaged in downgrading sales practices in relation to accidental death policies by offering these policies to customers who failed to qualify for life cover. Freedom also offered accidental death policies to policyholders who attempted to cancel their existing life insurance policy. Mr Orton accepted that neither of those practices should occur. Mr Orton also conceded that Freedom's sales processes for accidental death policies were deficient because the sales scripts failed to notify customers of the narrow definition of accident or the key exclusions from the policies. Mr Orton accepted that as a result, policyholders could be confused about what their policies covered. Until it stopped outbound sales of the product, Freedom sold significant numbers of accidental death policies around 20,000 policies in each of 2016 and 17. Despite this, Freedom has consistently received a very small number of claims, no more than 22 in any of the last three years. As to Freedom's remuneration and incentive structures, the Commission heard that between 2013 and 15, Freedom used a standard volume-based commission structure. In about 2015, Freedom began introducing variants to this model. Amongst other things, Freedom introduced requirements that sales agents cover their seat cost and the cost of their leads before they would be eligible to earn commission. Mr Orton conceded that this increased the possibility that sales agents would engage in aggressive sales tactics. More broadly, Mr Orton recognised that Freedom's commission structure over recent years had created a situation in which sales agents had been incentivised to aggressively pursue sales. In the breach notice that it provided to ASIC on the 7th of September 2018, Freedom notified ASIC that its remuneration arrangements between the 1st of January this year and May this year may have breached section 963E of the Corporations Act in respect of the variable component of sales agent remuneration. In the same breach notification, Mr Orton informed ASIC that from the 1st of October, no commission-based incentives will be made available to Freedom's sales teams. Mr Orton told the Commission that this was because of concerns that commissions may inappropriately influence the conduct of sales agents. In Mr Orton's words, 
any commission payable to a sales agent has the potential to be conflicted. Mr Orton also gave evidence about various incentive programs, including non-monetary incentive programs, which had been run by Freedom in recent years. A number of these incentive programs were based solely on sales made by a sales agent, without any qualifying quality assurance requirement. Mr Orton accepted that these incentive programs, particularly the higher value incentive programs, encouraged conflicted conduct by sales agents and that this risk was heightened where no quality assurance qualifications were placed upon participation. In its recent breach notice to ASIC, Freedom also told ASIC that it considered that certain incentive programs run between January and April this year constituted conflicted remuneration in breach of section 963E of the Corporations Act. Turning to Freedom's quality assurance and disciplinary processes, Mr Orton told the Commission that Freedom's quality assurance monitoring processes had been inadequate. The evidence also indicated that Freedom's call marking guidelines were insufficiently robust. For example, at the time Mr Stewart's son was sold his insurance, a sales call would not be marked as a fail if the sales agent provided many categories of misleading, deceptive, false or incomplete information. Many similar deficiencies persisted in the call marking guidelines until July this year. Mr Orton conceded that the marking guidelines should have been strengthened at an earlier point in time. The Commission also heard evidence about Freedom's ineffective disciplinary practices, including the actions taken in respect of the sales agent who sold the policy to Mr Stewart's son. That sales agent had received an initial written warning in January 2016 and a final written warning in February 2016. In the following months, additional concerns were raised about the sales agent's practices. For the most part, those warnings and concerns were not referred to in the fortnightly feedback that Freedom provided to the sales agent. Rather, the sales agent's supervisor continued to encourage him to aim big and sell more policies. Mr Orton conceded that the disciplinary processes in place at this time did not adequately respond to sales agents who engaged in misconduct and that there were broad problems in the feedback loop used by Freedom Insurance. Finally, we turn to Freedom's retention strategies. In its submission to the Commission, Freedom acknowledged approximately 27 instances of retention-related conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. The vast majority of instances related to complaints received since the start of February this year. Mr Orton accepted that Freedom's retention processes had been too strong and that Freedom had at times made it too difficult to cancel policies. Information provided by Freedom to ASIC indicated that over a 12-month period, Freedom had received an average of 72 cancellation requests a day and that policyholders had only succeeded in cancelling their policies in 28.5% of calls they made to Freedom. The Commission also heard about various retention marketing campaigns run by Freedom, including as recently as July. The retention campaigns were directed to dissuading policyholders from cancelling their policies or getting them to reinstate cancelled policies. Mr Orton conceded that these campaigns were designed to make it as difficult as possible to cancel policies and to win policyholders back after they had cancelled. Mr Orton said that the campaign should not have been initiated and that Freedom would stop campaigns of this nature. Now, Commissioner, I was to turn to the available uh, findings of misconduct in relation to Freedom, but I see the time, so I'm perhaps after the lunch break. 2 p.m. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, we'll come back at 2 p.m.
Yes, Ms. Orr. Commissioner, we turn to the available findings in relation to freedom insurance. On the evidence, it's open to find that Freedom may have engaged in misconduct in the following ways. First, by selling insurance to Mr Stewart's son in circumstances where the sales agent knew or ought to have known that Mr Stewart's son did not understand what he was agreeing to, Freedom may have engaged in unconscionable conduct within the meaning of section 12CA or 12CB of the ASIC Act. Second, in respect of the other four instances of misconduct relating to the sale of insurance policies to vulnerable consumers, which were the subject of Freedom's recent breach notification to ASIC, Freedom may also have engaged in unconscionable conduct within the meaning of sections 12CA and 12CB of the ASIC Act. Third, as accepted by Freedom in its breach notification, the conduct of Freedom sales agents demonstrated in connection with the five vulnerable consumers may have constituted a breach of sections 912A, 1A, 1CA and 1F of the Corporations Act. Fourth, Freedom failed until July this year to appropriately frame its call marking guidelines to ensure that serious misconduct, including legislative breaches, constituted a quality, quality assurance fail. By failing to have in place an adequate process to deter legislative breaches in the sales process, Freedom failed to take reasonable steps to ensure that its representatives complied with financial services laws for the purposes of section 912A1CA of the Corporations Act, or to have in place adequate risk management systems in contravention of section 912A1H of the Act. Fifth, in accordance with the acknowledgement contained in Freedom's breach notice, Freedom may have breached section 963E of the Corporations Act in respect of the variable component of its sales agent remuneration. Freedom also failed to have in place adequate arrangements for the management of conflicts of interest that arose between its employees and its policyholders in this regard in breach of section 912A1AA of the Corporations Act. Sixth, and also in accordance with the acknowledgement made by Freedom to ASIC, Freedom may have breached section 963 of the Corporations Act in respect of the non-monetary benefits that it provided to its representatives between January and April this year. Again, it may follow from this that Freedom failed to have in place adequate arrangements for the management of conflicts of interest that arose between its employees and its policyholders in breach of section 912A1AA of the Corporations Act. Seventh, and finally, Freedom acknowledged certain breaches of the anti-hawking provisions in the Corporations Act to both the Commission and to ASIC. On the evidence, it's also open to make the following findings of conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. First, Freedom acknowledged 29 instances of conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in respect of its retention and cancellation practices. Second, more generally, Freedom employs extremely heavy-handed retention strategies which result in policyholders finding it very difficult to cancel policies that they no longer want or need. The community would not expect that an insurance company would make it so difficult to cancel a policy in those circumstances. Third, in its submission to the Commission, Freedom acknowledged three additional instances of conduct that fell below community standards and expectations relating to its treatment of vulnerable customers, which were not picked up in its breach notification to ASIC. Fourth, Freedom's disciplinary procedures were inadequate to address problematic conduct by its sales agents. By way of example, Freedom encouraged the sales agent who sold the policy to Mr Stewart's son to sell aggressively, even in circumstances where there were serious compliance concerns in relation to the agent. The community would expect an organisation like Freedom to have and to apply robust disciplinary practices. Fifth, Freedom failed to appropriately recognise and respond to the harm suffered by Mr Stewart's son. This was demonstrated in a number of respects, 
including by Freedom's failure to call Mr Stewart back when it had promised to do so, Freedom's failure to ensure Mr Stewart received the call recordings in a timely manner, and the belittling tone of Freedom's internal communications about Mr Stewart and his son. On the evidence, it's open to find that the misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards and expectations can be attributed to Freedom's culture and governance practices and its remuneration practices. As Mr Orton accepted, Freedom's remuneration and incentive structure encouraged highly aggressive and inappropriate sales practices. Just one other aspect of uh, the uh, community response to events. I think the community might have been particularly struck uh, by the phone call uh, where the agent insisted upon uh, the son uh, uttering the words, I want to terminate the policy. It was a particularly affecting uh, record. Yes. Freedom's quality assurance and disciplinary processes were insufficient to deter and detect these inappropriate sales practices. These difficulties were compounded by Freedom's failure to provide any training to its staff about dealing with vulnerable consumers until February 2017. Commissioner, the third case study concerned ComInsure's handling of claims made under life insurance policies that provided trauma cover. It examined the way that ComInsure handled two particular claims, one involving an insured person who had a heart attack and the other involving an insured person who had breast cancer, as well as a number of issues relating to the definition of heart attack in ComInsure's policies. The Commission heard evidence from Ms Helen Troop, the Executive General Manager of Cominsure. In the first specific case that was examined, the insured took out a life insurance policy in 2000. That policy included cover for heart attacks as defined in the policy. The insured suffered a heart attack in January 2014 and made a claim under the policy later that month. The medical definitions in the insured's policy were updated from time to time. However, at the time the insured suffered his heart attack, Cominsure had not made any substantive changes to the definition of heart attack since July 2005. In accordance with the medical opinion of one of Cominsure's medical officers, Dr Carlos, Cominsure denied the insured's claim for a full trauma benefit on the basis of his heart attack because he did not meet the relevant policy definition. Amongst other things, the policy definition required elevation in levels of troponin above two micrograms per litre, but the insured's levels of troponin only rose to 1.9 micrograms per litre. The insured made a complaint to Cominsure in June 2014, but Cominsure did not change its decision. In March 2016, the ABC's Four Corners program and Fairfax Media reported on concerns about Cominsure's life insurance business. Among other things, the reporting raised concerns that the definition of heart attack in Cominsure's trauma policies was out of date and did not reflect developments in medical science. As a result of these reports, Cominsure decided to bring forward a planned update to its heart attack definition to March 2016. It decided to backdate the application of the updated definition to the 11th of May 2014. Shortly after these media reports, the insured made a complaint to FOS about his claim with Cominsure. At that time, a representative of CBA told the insured that the updated heart attack definition did not apply to his claim, which was made in January 2014, because the updated definition only applied from the 11th of May 2014. Despite this, the representative asked the insured for information to allow his claim to be assessed against the updated definition. Ms Troop acknowledged that this communication was likely to confuse the first insured and raise his hopes about the potential outcome of his claim. At about this time, CBA asked Dr Carlos to provide a further medical opinion about the claim 
assessing the claim against both the previous 2013 definition and the new 2016 definition of heart attack. Dr Carlos again concluded that the insured did not meet the 2013 definition, but said that he did satisfy the 2016 definition. On the basis of this opinion, CBA told FOS that it was still Cominsure's position that the insured did not meet the 2013 definition and that it was the 2013 definition that applied to his claim. CBA also challenged FOS's jurisdiction to deal with the dispute on the basis that the, dis that the dispute related to a matter of commercial judgment for Cominsure. In the words used by Ms Troop, FOS appropriately rejected Cominsure's challenge to its jurisdiction. Despite FOS having considered and rejected the jurisdictional argument at this time, CBA continued to maintain that the dispute was outside FOS's jurisdiction and twice challenged that jurisdiction again. Ms Troop acknowledged that this should not have happened and that CBA should have accepted FOS's determination as to its jurisdiction. Having rejected CBA's challenge to the jurisdiction, FOS asked CBA to provide the medical opinion on which it relied to say that the insured did not meet the 2013 definition and asked CBA to obtain and provide a medical opinion about whether the insured met the 2016 definition. In the covering email, CBA said that it declined FOS's request to obtain or provide a medical report to assess whether the applicant would satisfy the upgraded definition. Ms Troop accepted that it was misleading for CBA to convey to FOS that it did not already have a medical opinion about whether the insured met the 2016 definition. Ms Troop acknowledged that CBA acted inconsistently with FOS's terms of reference and ASIC Regulatory Guide 139 in refusing to provide this information to FOS. In July 2016, FOS wrote to CBA requesting further information, including information about the decision to backdate the 2016 definition to May 2014. CBA did not provide information about this decision to FOS because it did not consider it relevant to the dispute. Ms Troop acknowledged that the failure to respond to FOS's request was a breach of FOS's terms of reference and was not open or transparent. In August 2016, more than three months after FOS's first request, CBA provided Dr Carlos's opinion to FOS in unredacted form. FOS ultimately made a recommendation in favour of the insured. CBA rejected that recommendation, but settled the matter with the insured on an ex gratia basis. Ms Troop acknowledged that Cominsure's handling of the dispute contributed to the delay in resolving the dispute with the insured and affected CBA's relationship with FOS. In the second specific case that was examined, the Commission heard that the insured took out a life insurance policy in 1996. In March 2016, the insured was diagnosed with breast cancer and underwent two surgeries to have the cancer removed. Following this, in August 2016, she made a claim. At the time the insured made her claim, the definition of cancer that applied to her policy had not been updated since November 1998. One of the exclusions from that definition was carcinoma in situ, unless leading to radical breast surgery. In August 2016, Cominsure denied the insured's claim on the basis that she had a carcinoma in situ and her treatment did not involve radical breast surgery. Cominsure formed the view that the treatment did not constitute radical breast surgery because she had not undergone a mastectomy. Cominsure did not explain this in the letter it sent to the insured and Ms Troop acknowledged that the letter did not provide the insured with an adequate explanation as to why her claim had been de declined. The term radical breast surgery was not defined anywhere in the insured's policy. Similarly, the policy did not specify that a mastectomy was required to meet the definition of radical breast surgery. 
Ms Troop accepted that the lack of definition of radical breast surgery in the policy resulted in confusion for the insured. The insured and her husband told ComInsure they were not happy with its decision to decline the claim and in February 2017 they provided ComInsure with further information from the insured's GP and surgeon. Both medical practitioners said that the treatment the insured had for her breast cancer constituted radical breast surgery. Despite the views of these two medical practitioners, Cominsure maintained its decision to decline the claim, again on the basis that the insured did not have a mastectomy. Ms Troop accepted that Cominsure's decision to decline the claim was unacceptable in circumstances where Cominsure was relying on a definition of cancer that at that time was about 18 years old, imposed limitations on that definition that were not expressed in the policy documents, and did not account for the way in which the insured had been treated by her doctors and the opinion expressed by, by those doctors. Ms Troop also acknowledged that Cominsure had breached its duty to act towards the insured with the utmost good faith by denying her claim in those circumstances. The insured made a complaint to FOS in April 2017. Ms Troop accepted that CBA's engagement with FOS in relation to the complaint fell below what the community would expect of it. Specifically, CBA chose not to respond to FOS's request for information or to seek an extension of time to respond to that request. Ultimately, FOS made a recommendation in favour of the insured. The insured and ComInsure accepted the recommendation and ComInsure paid the insured $169,305 plus interest of just under $5,000. Ms Troop acknowledged that FOS made the right decision and that ComInsure's handling of the claim caused distress to the insured. Ms Troop also gave evidence about certain decisions that ComInsure made in relation to the heart attack definition including decisions about whether to update the definition and about the date from which the updated definition would be applied. Ms Troop told the Commission that between July 2005 and March 2016, Cominsure had considered updating its heart attack definition but decided not to. Ms Troop accepted that from at least early 2012, Cominsure knew that its definition of heart attack first did not reflect the universal definition of heart attack, which among other things required reference to whether the insured person's cardiac biomarkers were elevated above the 99th percentile of a normal reference population rather than above some absolute level. Second, depending on the laboratory equipment used, might have required troponin levels 20 times higher than those required under the universal definition of heart attack, and third, could discriminate against Cominsure's female customers, as it was harder for women to reach the troponin level specified in the definition. Ms Troop also told the Commission that in 2012, Cominsure's Chief Medical Officer had expressed the view that he would personally move to the universal definition of heart attack. Ms Troop accepted that Cominsure should have updated its definition of heart attack in 2012 to reflect the universal definition. Ms Troop acknowledged that the decision by Cominsure not to update the de definition of heart attack in 2012 fell below community standards and expectations. In 2013, Cominsure amended the name of its heart attack definition so that it was headed heart attack of a specified severity. Ms Troop accepted that prior to that change, people reading the policy would have assumed that the policy was intended to apply to all heart attacks. By May 2014, a number of other insurers had updated their heart attack definitions to reflect the universal definition. Ms Troop acknowledged that Cominsure's failure to update its definition in May 2014 was a commercial misjudgment that had adverse consequences for its policyholders. Ms Troop accepted that this misjudgment was at least in part the result of Cominsure focusing on commercial considerations at the expense of the interests of its consumers 
or the potential reputational risks to Cominsure. Ms Troop accepted that the decision not to update the definition in 2014 also fell below community standards and expectations. As we've mentioned, when Cominsure decided to update the heart attack definition in March 2016, it decided to backdate the application of the definition to the 11th of May 2014. Ms Troop told the Commission that this decision was based upon the date of the last relevant product disclosure statement. Ms Troop acknowledged that another reason for choosing this date was that it was in the middle of the period in which Cominsure's competitors had updated their definitions. After receiving a letter from ASIC in March 2017, Cominsure decided to backdate the definition of heart attack even further to October 2012. Ms Troop acknowledged that October 2012 was a more appropriate date to which to backdate the definition and that Cominsure should have settled on that date at the point that it decided that backdating was necessary. Ms Troop also gave evidence about the way that Cominsure advertised its trauma policies between December 2012 and March 2016. In connection with its investigation into Cominsure in 2016, ASIC raised concerns with Cominsure about its advertising of trauma policies. ASIC raised concerns that certain web pages and brochures made available by CBA were misleading or deceptive. In essence, ASIC's concern was that the material was not sufficiently qualified or limited to convey the specific criteria that consumers would need to meet to satisfy the heart attack definition. Ms Troop gave evidence about two web pages and two brochures made available by Cominsure concerning its trauma policies. She accepted that a person reading each of the documents would have been likely to believe that Cominsure's trauma policy covered all heart attacks, which was not the case. Ms Troop accepted that the documents were misleading. Cominsure had not made this acknowledgement prior to the Commission's hearings. ASIC did not take any enforcement action against Cominsure for these misleading advertisements. Rather, ASIC and Cominsure reached an agreement under which Cominsure would make a voluntary community benefit payment of $300,000 and would commission a compliance review of its advertising sign-off processes and procedures. In relation to the insured who suffered a heart attack, on the evidence, it is open to find that CBA's conduct in withholding part of Dr Carlos's medical opinion from FOS during the dispute with the insured and saying that it declined to obtain or provide such an opinion may amount to misconduct. Ms Troop acknowledged that this conduct misled FOS. She also conceded that CBA had failed to be open and transparent in its dealings with FOS and that it had acted inconsistently with ASIC Regulatory Guide 139 and FOS's terms of reference in this respect. It is also open to find that CBA may have engaged in misconduct by contravening Clause 7.2 of FOS's terms of reference when it declined to provide information requested by FOS about its decision to backdate its updated heart attack definition to May 2014. Ms Troop conceded that this contravened FOS's terms of reference and was not open or transparent. In relation to the web pages and brochures, on the evidence it's open to find that Cominsure engaged in misconduct in the following ways. Cominsure may have breached its statutory obligation under Section 12DA of the ASIC Act by engaging in misleading and deceptive conduct in relation to its advertising and promotional material for trauma policies, specifically in relation to cover for heart attacks. And Cominsure may also have breached its statutory obligation under Section 12DB of the ASIC Act by making false and misleading representations in that promotional material. In relation to the insured who suffered from breast cancer, on the evidence, it is open to find that Cominsure's handling of this claim may amount to misconduct. Specifically, that Cominsure may have breached its statutory obligation under Section 13 of the Insurance Contracts Act 
to act towards the insured with the utmost good faith. On the evidence, it's also open to make the following findings of conduct by ComInsure that fell below community standards and expectations. First, in relation to the heart attack definition in its trauma policies, as Ms Troop acknowledged, ComInsure's failure to update the definition in 2012 fell below community standards and expectations. As Ms Troop also acknowledged, ComInsure's failure to update the definition in 2014 was also a decision that fell below community standards and expectations. And ComInsure's decision in March 2016 to backdate the updated heart attack definition to May 2014 instead of October 2012 also fell below community standards and expectations. Second, in relation to the insured who suffered from breast cancer, ComInsure's failure to respond to FOS within the required time or request an extension of time in connection with the dispute was conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. The evidence supports a finding that the conduct of ComInsure that fell below community standards and expectations Specifically, the decisions not to update the heart attack definition in 2012 and 2014, and the decision to backdate the definition to May 2014 instead of October 2012, were attributable, at least in part, to ComInsure not adequately taking into account the interests of its customers in making those decisions, and instead being motivated by commercial considerations. Ms Troop acknowledged this to be the case. One of the matters referred to in the Commission's terms of reference is the effectiveness of mechanisms for redress. In both of the specific cases considered in this case study, there were aspects of CBA's dealings with FOS that were concerning. In the case of the first insured, who suffered from the heart attack, Ms Troop accepted that CBA misled FOS made inappropriate challenges to its jurisdiction and failed to provide information requested by FOS in breach of FOS's terms of reference. In the case of the second insured who suffered um, from breast cancer, CBA failed to respond to FOS within the required time without providing an explanation or requesting an extension of time. Both of these specific cases indicate a troubling lack of respect on the part of CBA for FOS and the external dispute resolution process more broadly. It is a requirement of section 912A of the Corporations Act that CBA be a member of an external dispute resolution scheme approved by ASIC. As this case study and others in this round of hearings demonstrated, external dispute resolution schemes like FOS are an important mechanism for redress for consumers in their dealings with insurance companies. When insurance companies fail to be open, transparent and responsive in their dealings with FOS, it undermines the effectiveness of external dispute resolution mechanisms as an effective mechanism for redress. Well, there's a series of particular questions emerging uh, from the common sure case, which together uh, yield a question capable of more general statement about uh, whether uh, departure from steps required by FOS terms of reference uh, is itself uh, simply conduct falling short of community standards or whether, uh, if it were established, would constitute a form of misconduct, at least in the form of breach of contract. Uh, it occurs to me that um, there is at least some textual footing in the terms of reference as they stood uh, as amended at 1 January 15 uh, for the notion that uh, the terms of reference bind the uh, financial uh, services uh, provider uh, 
I have in mind particularly 1.3 little a, these terms of reference are binding upon financial services providers and presumably the mechanism uh, or the legal mechanism is uh, contract, perhaps contract in light of statutory obligation but ultimately I think contract. Now the financial services providers in their submissions can no doubt tell me uh, how and why uh, that <coughs> is or is not the case. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, could we turn to the fourth case study, which concerned TAL's claims handling practices? The Commission heard evidence from Ms Lorraine Van Eden, the General Manager of Claims. Ms Van Eden made three statements to the Commission dealing with the experiences of three people who had made claims on TAL income protection policies. Only two of the statements were tendered, as the person to whom the third statement related did not wish to have their circumstances examined by the Commission. We turn first to the case of the first insured, who applied for an income protection policy from TAL in February 2009. In the online application form that she completed, she was asked whether she had or ever had had depression, anxiety, panic attacks, stress, psychosis, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, attempted suicide, chronic fatigue, postnatal depression or any other mental or nervous disorder. She answered no. TAL offered the insured income protection cover which she accepted. In May 2010, the first insured made a claim under her policy for stress-induced depression and anxiety, which was tied to circumstances at her workplace. Along with her claim form, the first insured provided Tao with a letter from her GP explaining that she had a generalised anxiety disorder that prevented her from working and indicating that the first insured's condition was a new onset illness. Pursuant to an authority provided by the first insured, Tao began bringing in the first insured's medical records and records about a related workers' compensation claim. When asked about Tao's approach to investigations at that time, Ms Van Eden accepted that until 2013, it was Tao's practice to bring in extensive medical information about a claimant for the purpose of determining whether their policy could be avoided on the basis of non-disclosure. Ms Van Eden accepted that this practice was not acceptable. In September 2016, TAL introduced a formal guideline relating to investigations. Under this guideline, TAL authorised case managers to undertake a general review, even when there were no inconsistencies identified between the underwriting disclosures and the claim information, to ensure there was no adverse non-disclosure. Ms Van Eden conceded that these reviews amounted to fishing expeditions by case managers and that TAL had engaged in a fishing expedition in relation to the first insured's claim. Based on the information obtained by the case manager, the case manager formed the view that the first insured may have failed to disclose a pre-existing history of work-related stress when applying for her policy and answered the mental health question inaccurately. Ms Van Eden did not agree with this assessment. Despite the first insured's attempts to address TAL's concerns, TAL relied on section 29.3 of the Insurance Contracts Act to avoid the first insured's policy on the basis that she had breached her duty of disclosure and made a misrepresentation. The first insured applied to TAL for internal review of the decision. In November 2010, TAL's IDR team confirmed the initial decision. Upon reviewing the letter that TAL's IDR team sent to the first insured, Ms Van Eden agreed that the IDR team did not seriously engage with the first insured's request for internal review and that the letter merely reiterated the claim team's decision. In February 2011, the first insured lodged a complaint with FOS about the avoidance of her policy. As part of this process, the first insured provided extensive medical material to, to TAL. 
Ms Van Eden accepted that this material provided a comprehensive response to the allegations being put by TAL against the first insured. However, despite this, TAL continued to defend the FOS dispute. On the 5th of October 2012, more than two years after the first insured made her claim to TAL, FOS delivered a recommendation in favour of the first insured, finding that TAL was not entitled to avoid her policy. TAL rejected the recommendation. Ms Van Eden conceded that this decision was inappropriate. FOS later delivered a determination in favour of the first insured, directing TAL to reinstate the policy and to pay benefits to the first insured with interest. Following this, TAL did a number of things which were inconsistent with the spirit of the determination, including requesting that the first insured repay premiums that TAL had previously refunded in order for her claim to be assessed as well as failing to promptly assess all aspects of the first insured's claim and failing to pay interest in the correct sum and for the full period. Ms Van Eden agreed... More than spirit. Yes, that's, that's, that's so. Spirit and terms, I should yeah. say, Commissioner. Yeah. Ms Van Eden agreed that TAL should have moved more quickly to put the first insured in the position that she would have been in had TAL assessed her claim correctly three years earlier. In November 2013, about eight months after the FOS determination, TAL began to conduct surveillance on the first insured. The surveillance lasted for at least four months and included desktop surveillance and physical surveillance. Ms Van Eden accepted that the material reported to TAL was very personal and highly intrusive of the first insured's privacy and that more generally, the surveillance authorised by TAL in this case was deeply inappropriate. In December 2013, while the surveillance was ongoing, TAL asked the first insured to complete a daily activity diary commencing from the 4th of November 2013. Ms Van Eden accepted that this was another attempt by TAL to disprove the first insured's entitlement to benefits. Despite the first insured having provided TAL with medical evidence that the daily diary was exacerbating her state of anxiety and likely having a negative impact on her health, TAL continued to insist on completion of the diary. Ms Van Eden accepted that this resulted in harm to the first insured and accepted that some of the case manager's communications with the first insured about the diary amounted to bullying. Ms Van Eden also accepted that the case manager made a misrepresentation to the first insured by telling her that completion of the diary was a term of the policy. The first insured made a further complaint to FOS about TAL's insistence upon the daily diary. In its submissions to FOS, TAL said that it was standard practice in the industry to require the completion of a diary. Ms Van Eden accepted that it was not but was unable to say why TAL had misrepresented the position to FOS. In March 2014, while the second FOS dispute was ongoing, TAL informed the first insured that it had determined that she no longer met the definition of total disablement and that it would cease paying benefits to her and she would be required to repay $69,000 in benefits that she had been paid to date. In support of its decision, TAL relied upon Section 56.1 of the Insurance Contracts Act, which applies to fraudulent claims. Ms Van Eden accepted that the first insured's claim had not been made fraudulently and that the communication of these matters would have caused considerable distress to the first insured. Ms Van Eden also agreed that by this time, the case manager managing the first insured's case had no regard for the first insured's well-being and was on a mission to stop her from receiving benefits under the insurance policy. In April 2014, TAL declined an invitation from FOS to participate in a conciliation conference with a view to resolving the first insured's claim. In November 2014, FOS delivered its recommendation in the second dispute. FOS found that the first insured had not made a fraudulent claim, 
that it was not fair and reasonable to require her to complete the diary and that she remained entitled to benefits. TAL challenged the recommendation insofar as it related to the diary. The matter proceeded to a determination where FOS again found in favour of the first insured. After the determination, TAL again failed to calculate the payment of interest correctly and since the determination, TAL has continued to engage in heavy-handed tactics in relation to the first insured's claim and has continued to make various systems errors and administrative errors in respect of her case. Overall, Ms Van Eden accepted that TAL's conduct was a deeply troubling response to a legitimate mental health claim, that it involved a series of wrong decisions and very troubling breaches of the first insured's privacy. Ms Van Eden accepted that the poor conduct extended over a significant number of years and involved numerous TAL employees. She also accepted that TAL did not impose disciplinary consequences on two of the case managers who had handled the first insured's file. The second insured took out a TAL income protection policy in October 2013. At the time that she obtained the policy, she was asked whether she had ever had or received medical advice or treatment for a significant number of health conditions, including depression, anxiety, panic attacks, or any other mental or nervous condition? She answered no. In mid-December 2013, the second insured was diagnosed with cervical cancer. She made a claim on her policy in January 2014. From January to May, Tal paid the claim. And throughout this period, Tal brought in and reviewed information about the second insured's medical history. Tal ostensibly did so because the second insured's claim was made in close proximity to the risk commencement date. However, Ms Van Eden accepted that this was another general review or fishing expedition conducted by the case manager. This was reinforced by the fact that the medical information brought in was not confined to information relevant to the claimed condition. TAL did not inform the second insured that it was conducting these investigations. At the end of June 2014, without giving the second insured prior notice, TAL avoided her contract of insurance on the basis that she had failed to disclose a prior history of depression. Ms Van Eden accepted that at this time, TAL generally did not give policyholders an opportunity to provide information prior to their policy being avoided for non-disclosure and that this was a systemic deficiency within TAL. TAL first communicated this decision to the second insured by phone. After listening to a recording of the call, Ms Van Eden acknowledged that TAL had not informed the second insured of its decision in an appropriate way there had been a lack of empathy and lack of sensitivity towards the second insured situation. The situation was compounded by the second insured's case manager having left her with the impression that she might need to pay back the benefits that she had received from TAL under the policy. And overall, the way in which the phone call was handled fell below community standards and expectations. TAL subsequently sent a letter to the second insured confirming that her policy would be avoided. TAL asserted in that letter that the second insured had breached her duty of good faith under Section 13 of the Insurance Contracts Act. Ms Van Eden acknowledged that this assertion was itself a breach by TAL of its duty of utmost good faith. Ms Van Eden also acknowledged that until recently, if TAL de declined a claim for non-disclosure, its communications to the policyholder would generally allege that the policyholder had breached their duty of good faith. Ms Van Eden conceded that there would have been many cases of innocent non-disclosure in which this allegation was made and which would have been very unfair to the policyholder. The letter to the second insured also emphasised that TAL retained its right to recover the payments it had made to the policyholder. Until about 2017, it had been TAL's practice to reserve its right to repayment of benefits where it voided a policy for non-disclosure. 
The second insured also challenged TAL's decision in FOS. While the FOS dispute was ongoing, TAL undertook further investigations into the second insured's disclosures. Ms Van Eden accepted that TAL did so to try and find a basis for avoidance which was directly related to the claimed condition. TAL sought a second retrospective underwriting opinion in relation to some symptoms experienced by the second insured prior to entering into the policy, which may have been indicative of cervical cancer. The underwriter advised that if those symptoms had been disclosed, the insured's application for a policy would have been refused on that basis, potentially providing TAL with an alternative basis for avoiding the contract of insurance. Upon receiving the opinion, TAL's general manager of claims expressed some concern about TAL trying to make retrospective decisions when the facts at the time were different. In April 2015, TAL and the second insured attended a FOS conciliation conference. Despite having known of the proposed additional basis for avoidance for at least two weeks, TAL only notified the insured of the additional basis on the day before the conciliation conference. Ms Van Eden did not know whether this was a strategic decision by TAL, but accepted that it was part of a broader pattern of delay in TAL's dealings with FOS in this matter. Following the conciliation conference, TAL and the second insured settled the dispute by TAL waiving its right to recover the $25,000 paid to the second insured and paying her a further $25,000. We turn to the case of the third insured in respect of whom a statement was not tendered. Because no statement was tendered, the cross-examination in this part of the case study focused upon a number of acknowledgements made by TAL in the untendered statement. First, TAL's Claims Decision Committee had determined to avoid the third insured's policy, but before that decision was communicated to the third insured, the case manager added some additional grounds for avoidance, namely an alleged non-disclosure of a mental health condition. This additional information was derived from the contents of an underwriting opinion obtained by the case manager, which was inconsistent with the committee's decision. TAL then communicated that revised information to the third insured. Ms Van Eden accepted that the case manager should not have communicated the content of the underwriting decision rather than the decision of the committee to the third insured and that this fell below what the community would expect. Ms Van Eden attributed this to a lack of oversight of and rigour in the case manager's decision making process. Second, following TAL's decision to avoid the third insured's policy, the third insured applied for internal review of that decision. Following the internal review, the file was returned to the original case manager. That case manager undertook a review of the file that extended beyond the recommendation made by TAL's IDR team. Ms Van Eden accepted that the case manager's failure to conduct a review in accordance with the IDR team's recommendation fell below what the community would expect. Ms Van Eden also told the Commission that TAL is currently revising its processes to ensure that claims are no longer remitted from its IDR team back to the original case manager to improve independence in the decision-making process. Third, Ms Van Eden acknowledged that in light of both of those matters, TAL's decision to defend the third insured's matter in FOS fell below community standards and expectations. Fourth, similarly to the case of the first insured, Ms Van Eden accepted that TAL knew about but did nothing to stop the inappropriate approach that had been applied to the third insured's claim. Fifth, similarly to the case of the second insured, Ms Van Eden accepted that TAL should have handled the insured's claim with greater sensitivity and empathy. The Commission heard that as a result of the issues raised in these case studies, Ms Van Eden will review all mental health claims that TAL declined for non-disclosure between 2013 and 2016 to ensure that appropriate processes were followed in each case. It is open to find that TAL engaged in misconduct in a number of respects. 
First, in relation to the first insured, TAL acknowledged that it had breached its duty of utmost good faith towards the insured, breached professional standards and engaged in conduct that was misleading. In making these admissions, TAL referred to numerous types of inappropriate conduct, including the engagement of and inappropriate utilisation of and instructions to external investigators, the excessive use of surveillance, bullying tactics and offensive communications, misrepresentation of policy terms and misuse of the daily activities diary. Second, in relation to the second insured, TAL accepted it may have breached its duty of utmost good faith by telling her, when it avoided her contract of insurance, that she had breached her duty of utmost good faith. At most, the second insured had innocently failed to disclose certain information about her medical history. Third, TAL acknowledged that until early 2017, its standard practice was to tell policyholders whose contracts were being avoided under Section 29 of the Insurance Contracts Act that they had breached their duty of good faith. In those circumstances, and given the admission made in respect of the second insured, it's open to find that TAL systemically breached its duty of good faith when communicating with policyholders whose policies had been avoided for non-disclosure. Ms Van Eden accepted that there were many cases of innocent non-disclosure in which TAL would have made this allegation in circumstances that were very unfair to the policyholder. Fourth, it's open to the Commissioner to find that at least until 2013, TAL systemically breached its duty of good faith to policyholders in its approach to investigations. Ms Van Eden accepted that until that time, TAL would go out and call for every kind of report from policyholders' medical practitioners and would seek out medical information that extended well beyond the claimed condition. Ms Van Eden accepted that the purpose of doing this was to determine whether TAL might be entitled to avoid a policy on the basis of non-disclosure. On the evidence, it's open to find that TAL may have engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in a number of respects. First, TAL failed to ensure that it had adequate systems to train its case managers and to oversee the actions of its case managers. In the case of the first and third insureds, this resulted in a number of inappropriate decisions being made and a failure by TAL to correct those decisions in a timely manner or at all. Second, at least until 2016, TAL failed to have in place robust systems to avoid potential conflicts of interest. As demonstrated by the case of the first insured, TAL permitted a case manager to sit on the Claims Decision Committee when the committee was reviewing the case manager's recommendation. As demonstrated by the case of the third insured, TAL remitted claims to case managers after TAL's IDR team had essentially indicated that the case manager had taken the wrong approach. The community would expect that an insurer would have more robust systems to avoid potential conflicts. Third, and relatedly, as was apparent in the case of the first insured, TAL failed to have adequate systems in place to ensure that its internal dispute resolution team conducted a robust analysis of declined claims in a way that was independent of the claims team. Fourth, TAL failed to engage with FOS in a cooperative and frank way. Amongst other things, TAL provided misleading information to FOS delayed providing relevant information, refused to participate in a conciliation conference with the first insured, and failed to comply with FOS's decisions in a timely manner, or in some respects, until pushed by FOS to do so. The community would expect better. Well, and again, there's this question of... Misconduct. Is that a, is that a breach of contract? Yes, and therefore misconduct. Yes. Fifth... As we saw in the case of the second and third insureds, until mid-2017, TAL failed to accord procedural fairness to policyholders prior to avoiding their policies. 
The community would expect that if TAL was considering avoiding a person's policy, it would offer them the opportunity to make submissions to TAL, and those submissions would then be the subject of serious considerations. Sixth, as acknowledged by TAL, several as aspects of the way that TAL communicated with the first, second and third insured fell below community standards and expectations. In relation to the first insured, TAL accepted that it communicated in a way that was inappropriate, bullying, threatening and misleading. In respect of each of the three insureds, TAL failed to communicate in a sensitive and empathetic way that recognised the difficult circumstances they were facing. Amongst other things, this was evidenced by TAL leaving the second insured with the impression that she might be required to repay the benefits that she had obtained under the policy. Finally, TAL failed to have adequate systems in place to avoid serious administrative errors, such as erroneous notifications of policy cancellation for non-payment of premiums. As acknowledged in respect of the first insured, these types of errors were likely to cause significant distress to claimants. It is open to find that one cause of the misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards and expectations was the minimal training and oversight of TAL case managers. Ms Van Eden accepted that at the time when the three claims were made, 2010, 2014 and 2015, there was minimal oversight within TAL of its senior case managers. Further, Ms Van Eden told the Commission that there were no structured ongoing training programs in relation to TAL's claims handling processes and procedures and no mandatory induction training for new TAL employees. Ms Van Eden acknowledged that this was a serious flaw in TAL's systems. Another potential cause was the internal culture of TAL at the time that the claims were made. Ms Van Eden said that she was unable to speak to TAL's general culture during that period as she was not employed by TAL at the time. However, Ms Van Eden accepted that there were multiple employees of TAL involved in extremely poor conduct across the three files over different periods of time. These included people at all levels of the business, from the claims team, the internal dispute resolution team and the external dispute resolution team. Ms Van Eden accepted that the fact that there were so many problems with so many people involved over such a lengthy period of time was telling in terms of TAL's culture. Another potential cause of the misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards was a systemic lack of independence in TAL's decision-making processes. Ms Van Eden accepted that the internal dispute resolution team and the external dispute resolution team were insufficiently independent of the business at the time that the three claims were handled. Finally, when asked about TAL's key performance indicators and whether they were drivers of poor claims handling conduct, Ms Van Eden said that they were not and said that case managers did not have a KPI connected with the non-payment of claims. Ms Van Eden accepted that TAL had and has KPIs connected to claims closure, but she said that these related to finalising claims within a particular time frame. Despite this, when shown a breakdown of TAL's KPIs for team managers in 2015, Ms Van Eden accepted that 50% of TAL's scorecard for team managers depended on profit targets. In relation to the effectiveness of mechanisms for redress, we make similar observations about TAL to the observations we made about CBA. The individual cases considered in this case study indicated a culture within TAL that had inadequate respect for FOS. There's a, particularly in the first case study, there's a further set of issues which I think is difficult to um, articulate um, sufficiently accurately. But I, 
was struck by the evidence given in that first case study, uh, I think in the form of the last uh, treating doctor's opinion, which said in effect, and I need to go back and read it and be very careful about whether I'm accurately recording it, but I, my impression was the doctor was saying uh, his patient was worse because of the way in which the insurer had treated her. Now, uh, that's a 12-inch brush uh, description of a much more subtle uh, medical report, I think, and I need to go back and read it. But to the extent to which it's accurate, uh, it presents a set of issues, or may present a set of issues, of, well, does that matter? What, obviously it does to the patient, but is it something which in any sense uh, the insurer uh, is somehow to be held accountable? Now, within my terms of reference, that becomes, is there misconduct or conduct falling short? Well, I would have thought that to the extent to which an insurer's actions make the medical condition of the insured worse, uh, the community may form a view, uh, if that's all is known, reasonably quickly. But uh, whether it's a form of misconduct may turn, may it not, on whether the steps taken were sufficiently well based in contractual rights, powers, privileges. And my impression, subject to what Tal later have to tell me, is that there seemed to be uh, perhaps uh, some question about whether all of the steps taken in that first case uh, would find a sufficient or sufficiently firm base in contra contractual powers, privileges, rights, etc. Now, I don't know. Now, that's far too general, far too imprecise, but I think Tal should be aware of the fact that there is a set of issues which I think emerges, which I have not articulated properly, about what would follow if there were available evidence which suggested that their conduct had caused, in this case, diagnosable and diagnosed psychiatric injury to the insured. Now, I think, Commissioner, you are referring to the psychiatric report of Dr Dinan, uh, which we tendered into evidence. And our recollection of that report is that um, it, it recorded that the psychiatric condition of the insured had been the subject of significant deterioration over a particular period, that there was increased paranoia mm. and anxiety and stress, mm. and that the insured um, spoke of her insurer, her experiences with the insurer in connection with the presentation of those symptoms. Mm. Uh, and I think our position would be that that psychiatric evidence um, is demonstrative of the breach of the utmost duty of good faith in section 13 of the Insurance Contracts Act, which we say emerges from the evidence as one of the forms of misconduct. Yes, I see. No, I understand that. And uh, utmost good faith might also uh, be particularly relevant to making unjustifiable or unjustified uh, allegations of fraud. Yes, absolutely. Uh, allegations of fraud are not likely to be bandied about. Yes. 
Now, Commissioner, uh, we're about to move to another case study. Uh, would uh, you be open to a brief break before we did so? <laughs> Not careful, Ms. Ms. Orr. It'll be a very long break. But if I come back at, say, uh, what, 10 past 3? Is Thank that... you, Commissioner. Right, 10 Thank past you. 3 it is. Mr Costello. Commissioner, the first group life case study concerned the conduct of the Retail Employee Superannuation Trust, or REST, in relation to life insurance, TPD and income protection policies offered to REST members. The Commission heard evidence from Lachlan Ross, project specialist in the REST operations team. REST has about 2 million members. Between 1.4 and 1.5 million of those members have group life insurance with REST. Since 2004, AIA has been REST's group life insurer. AIA will receive annual premiums of between $750 million and $800 million from REST this year. Mr Ross told the Commission that insurance cover was very valuable to REST's membership. Turning first to REST's prescribed minimum balance clause, until December 2017, the default policies offered to REST's members contained a prescribed minimum balance clause that operated in conjunction with a prescribed employment status clause. In tandem, these clauses meant that if a member's balance fell below a certain amount, $3,000 for TPD insurance and $1,200 for life insurance, um, and a member was not working or did not receive contributions from their employer, the member would lose the default life and TPD cover after 71 days. During the five-year period from 2013 to 2018, the operation of the minimum balance requirement led to REST denying the claims of 11 members and the TPD claims of 36 members. <coughs> as to REST's internal processes for dealing with cessation of cover, as soon as REST became aware that a member had ceased working, and had a balance below the minimum threshold, it would cease charging premiums to that member. However, in the event that REST was not notified that a member had ceased working, it would continue to deduct premiums from the member's account, regardless of whether the account had a balance below the minimum threshold. In addition, REST frequently communicated with members in a way that did not accurately reflect the terms of the group life policy. REST disclosed 52 separate miscommunication incidents affecting more than 48,500 members. Mr Ross accepted that the operation of the minimum balance and prescribed employment status clauses made it complicated to communicate with members about their level of cover and that this was one of the reasons that REST removed the minimum balance clause in December of last year. The Commission heard evidence about how these clauses operate in two operated in two specific cases. In the first, a REST member became totally and permanently disabled five days after his cover lapsed. Until a claim was made, REST had not been aware that the member had previously ceased work and REST continued to deduct insurance premiums at the time of the member's injury. The member's TPD claim was denied, but REST refunded the premiums paid by the member after the date his employment ceased. In the second case, a woman had joined REST in 2005 and was rendered paraplegic in May 2012 after falling from the fifth floor of a building. After the member was injured, she received her 2012 REST annual statement. The statement informed the member that she had TPD coverage of $108,000. The statement did not mention the $3,000 minimum balance requirement. Mr Ross gave evidence that this information possibly should have been included in REST's annual statements. In January 2014, with the assistance of her lawyers, the member submitted a TPD claim to REST. It took REST six months to provide the claim to AIA. Mr Ross gave evidence that this took too long and that the delay of this length would now be unusual. After being notified of the claim, AIA had to follow up REST for further information on a number of occasions. In November 2014, AIA accepted the member's claim and transferred $108,000 to REST. In December 2014, REST emailed AIA requesting that AIA review its decision and refunded the full payment. 
Mr Ross said that this communication was made because REST had realised that it had made an administrative mistake in relation to the member's last employment date and had failed to enter that date into its systems. Mr Ross considered that it was appropriate for REST's administrator to have acted in that way, despite REST's obligation to do everything that is reasonable to pursue an insurance claim for the benefit of a beneficiary if the claim has a reasonable prospect of success. After the member commenced litigation in the Supreme Court of New South Wales, AIA settled the claim. Mr Ross said that he did not believe that REST failed to act in the best interests of this member, but that with hindsight he wished REST could have done more to get the benefit paid to the member sooner. Turning next to the evidence about the operation of REST's TPD clause, Mr Ross told the Commission that TPD is the most complex type of insurance offered in group life policies. REST's definition of totally and permanently disabled has three disjunctive limbs. The first limb has two elements. A person must be absent from work for a period of three consecutive months and be so disabled that they are unlikely to engage in any occupation for which they are reasonably suited through education, training or experience. The second element of the first limb is very similar to the de definition of permanent incapacity in Regulation 1.03 Capital C of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Regulations 1994. The second limb of REST's definition of TPD will be met if a member has suffered specific injuries, for example the loss of two hands or two feet. The third limb of the definition requires that the member be unable to perform at least two activities of daily living, being dressing, bathing, toileting, mobility or feeding without assistance. Mr Ross accepted that it was possible for a member to satisfy the first limb of REST's definition, but not the second or third limbs. However, REST will only assess a member's eligibility against the first limb if the member satisfies REST that they have been in gainful employment in the 13 months before the incident. REST's policy defines gainful employment as being employed for gain or award in any business, trade, profession or employment for at least 10 hours per week. If a member does not meet the gainful employment requirement, REST will assess their eligibility for TPD benefits under the second and third limb of the policy definition, but not the first limb. In the last five years, REST has declined the death or TPD claims of 224 of its members based on the operation of its prescribed employment status requirements, including the gainful employment requirement. REST also provides default income protection cover to its members. Mr Ross considered that this form of insurance cover was particularly valuable to REST's membership. A member may not claim the income protection benefit if that member is unemployed. Despite this, absent explicit notification that a member has ceased working, Mr Ross was not aware of any systems that REST had in place to detect and stop the deduction of income protection premiums for unemployed members. Mr Ross accepted that this meant that those members would be paying a premium for a policy on which they could not claim, but did not accept that income protection insurance would be junk insurance in those circumstances. In the last five years, REST declined 37 income protection claims due to the requirement for the claimant to be employed. Turning to the insurance in, super, in superannuation code of practice, Mr Ross said that REST had expressed its intention to comply with the Insurance in Superannuation Code of Practice by the end of 2029. Clause 5.17 of the Code relates to communications with members and requires an entity to provide a member with an annual statement that includes information about the type of cover the member holds, how much they are insured for, their current premium, an explanation for any changes in their premium and the policy standard exclusions and rules for automatic cessation of cover. The code also requires entities who receive a completed claim form to either provide the claim form to the insurer or tell the member they are not entitled, uh, they are not eligible to claim within five business days. Mr Ross was not aware of whether REST currently satisfies the five day requirement. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that REST may have engaged in misconduct in the following respects. 
First, REST's conduct in continuing to deduct, in, to deduct insurance premiums when a person is no longer covered by insurance may constitute a failure to perform the trustee's duties and exercise the trustee's powers in the best interests of the beneficiaries as required by section 52C of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. Second, REST's conduct in relation to the member who became paraplegic may have demonstrated a failure to do everything that is reasonable to pursue an insurance claim for the benefit of a beneficiary if the claim has a reasonable prospect of success. Such conduct would be a contravention of section 52 subsection 7D of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that REST may have engaged in conduct falling below community standards and expectations in the following respects. First, by failing to communicate with members about key exclusions, such as the prescribed minimum balance exclusion in annual statements. Once the code comes into effect, this conduct would constitute a breach of clause 5.17 of the code. Second, by continuing to deduct premiums from members, such as the paraplegic member, when they were not covered by the policy. Once the code comes into effect, trustees will be required to notify members no later than six months after receipt of the member's last eligible contribution and to include various requests and warnings in that communication. Third, by deducting income protection premiums from unemployed members who were unable to claim on their policies. And fourth, by failing to have sufficient systems in place to detect when a member was unemployed and therefore at risk of losing cover. The community would expect that a superannuation fund systems would be capable of detecting when a member is in this position, even absent notification from the member. That conduct can be attributed to the inadequacies of REST systems, including a lack of systems to detect changes in members' circumstances that materially affect their insurance cover. It may also be attributable to systems which have an over-reliance on hard copy claim forms and which carry with them a greater risk of human processing errors. Commissioner, at the conclusion of Mr Ross's evidence, after the conclusion of Mr Ross's evidence, additional, an additional statement, uh, sorry, additional statements prepared on REST's behalf were tendered. One of those statements was from Mr Paul Howard. Yesterday afternoon, REST provided a further statement of Mr Howard that supplements paragraphs 5A and 13 of his earlier statement by providing additional information not known to Mr Howard at the date of his initial statement. That additional information includes that yesterday REST filed a breach report with ASIC in which REST stated that it considered that it had inadvertently breached various provisions including section 101 subsection 1C of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act, which requires trustees to provide reasons for a decision in response to a complaint about the proposed payment of a death benefit. REST said that it had done so 184 times since the 15th of March 2017. It follows from that evidence that it is also open to you, Commissioner, to find that REST has engaged in misconduct by breaching sections 29 capital E 1A and 101 1C of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act and section 912 1B, sorry, 912 A 1B and C of the Corporations Act. Those breaches are also attributable to REST's systems specifically to its template letter for conveying decisions in response to complaints about the proposed payment of death benefits. Commissioner, I tender the statement of Paul Howard, dated 20 September 2018, with document ID WIT.0001.0171.0001 document becomes Exhibit 6.422. Thank you, Commissioner. Aspects of the group life arrangements of AMP were also considered in this hearing block. The case study concerned two RSE licensees, AMP Superannuation Limited 
and NM Superannuation Proprietary Limited. Both entities sit within the AMP group. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Paul Sainsbury, Group Executive Wealth Solutions and Customer for AMP Group. AMP Life Limited, a wholly owned subsidiary of AMP Limited, is the group life insurer for most members of the trustees' funds. It is also the administrator of all of AMP Superannuation Limited's funds and some of NM Superannuation's funds. Mr Sainsbury could not say precisely how long this arrangement had been in place, but agreed that it had certainly been for a very long time. Mr Sainsbury's evidence was that tenders do not occur for the provision of group life insurance to the members of the trustees' funds, which we take to mean its public offer funds. Mr Sainsbury was taken to Prudential Standard SPS 250, Insurance in Superannuation, one requirement of which is that the trustee be able to satisfy itself and demonstrate to APRA that the engagement of the insurer is conducted at arm's length and is in the best interests of beneficiaries. Mr Sainsbury did not accept that a conflict arose by AMP Life acting as the group life insurer and also undertaking the prudential tasks connected with the assessment of the group life arrangements. <coughs> Mr Sainsbury's evidence was that there was sufficient separation of roles within AMP life to satisfy the requirements of SPS 250. The Commission heard evidence that members who were part of their employer's superannuation plan with AMP were charged default insurance rates when they ceased employment and were delinked from their employer's account. Those members were known as delinked employees. The evidence before the Commission was that D-linked employees were defaulted to a standard insurance rate. Mr Sainsbury's evidence was that D-linked employees were defaulted to this rate because AMP did not have a full understanding of the health of those members. Mr Sainsbury described the standard rate as being different to an actual smoker rate, although he accepted that for group life policies there were only two rates, the standard rate and the non-smoker rate. Mr Sainsbury accepted that the only criteria applicable to a member being moved from the standard rate to the non-smoker rate was the submission by the member of a non-smoker declaration. Mr Sainsbury also accepted that the nuanced differences between the rates would be difficult for a member to understand. The Commission heard evidence of a case where a delinked employee who did not smoke was informed by his financial advisor that he had been classified as a smoker. The member was unaware that he was classified as a smoker. It was not stated on his annual statement. At the time of the discovery, the member was charged $2,600 in premiums per month. The premiums reduced to $1,600 per month on the member's reclassification as a non-smoker. To that point in time, the member had been charged almost $77,000 in additional premiums. AMP declined to refund the member on the basis that its records showed that the member was issued with the non-smoker declaration at the time of his delinking and that it had clearly explained what would happen to his insurance once he left his employer. That was the sole occasion where the matter was drawn squarely to the member's attention. An AMP document described AMP's failure to include the smoker status in his annual statement as unethical. Mr Sainsbury did not agree with that statement. Mr Sainsbury's evidence was that the member received a welcome letter on delinking and was given an opportunity at that stage to elect non-smoking rates. The member subsequently lodged a complaint with the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal AMP's position remained that it had acted appropriately and should not be required to refund the additional premiums. The tribunal held that AMP had not acted fairly and reasonably in refusing to refund the customer. Mr Sainsbury accepted that it would have been better if the annual statements disclosed the smoker status, particularly in circumstances where there was a very significant differential in the premium. After this incident, in 2013, AMP member statements 
commenced including this information. Mr Sainsbury said that he was familiar with ASIC Report 529 entitled Member Experience of Superannuation, in which ASIC expressed the view that only 14.5 per cent of adults were daily smokers and that in these circumstances it was, it was statistically appropriate to assume that a person is not a smoker in the absence of other information about that member or the group of members. Mr Sainsbury was not aware of the trustees taking any step to implement that view. The Commission also heard evidence that in April 2018, AMP Life identified that life insurance premiums were continuing to be deducted from deceased members' accounts and that after payment of a death benefit, refunds were not being processed to a, death member, to a deceased member's account. AMP investigated this issue following evidence given by the Commonwealth Bank of Australia at the Commission's second round of hearings concerning fees being charged to deceased wealth customers. On the 26th of June 2018, AMP notified ASIC and APRA that it had breached section 912A subsection 1C of the Corporations Act and sections 29VC and 522B of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act because insurance premiums charged after the member's death were either not refunded or the refunded amount was incorrect. That breach notification identified 3,124 members with a total of $922,902 in premium refunds owing. AMP said that it determined the matter was reportable under section 912D of the Corporations Act and section 29JA of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act on 12 June 2018. As at 5 September 2018, AMP had identified that 4,645 customers were affected by the issue with $1.3 million in premium refunds owing. There was evidence before the Commission that the issue of continuing to deduct life insurance premiums from deceased members' accounts had been raised within AMP in at least 2015. Mr Sainsbury's view was that this issue was different to the matter reported to APRA and ASIC under section 912D in 2018. That was because the breach notification issued in 2018 included the fact that not only were the premiums being charged, but they were also not being refunded. However, Mr Sainsbury conceded that life insurance premiums were being incorrectly deducted from deceased members' accounts in 2016 and that fact was not reported to ASIC or APRA and still has not been reported as at 17 September 2018. Mr Sainsbury accepted that AMP had no continuing entitlement to charge premiums for life insurance to a member who was deceased. The Commission also heard evidence that a member of AMP Superannuation Limited's My Super product, who was diagnosed with a very serious illness, was not provided with insurance. Section 68, capital A, capital A of the Superannu Superannuation Industry Supervision Act requires trustees who offer my super products to ensure that the fund provides, relevantly, a permanent incapacity benefit to each my super member on an opt-out basis. The member was a D-linked employee and lost his insurance coverage when he ceased employment with his then employer. The member had also been paying fees to a financial advisor who had not drawn the member's attention to the fact that there was no insurance connected with the group life uh, superannuation account. The member's wife wrote to Craig Meller, the then CEO of AMP, who referred the matter to AMP's customer advocate. Mr Sainsbury accepted that the member held a My Super product at the time the member's wife had written to Mr Meller. Mr Sainsbury was aware of the duty imposed on trustees under section 68 capital A capital A to provide permanent incapacity benefits to each my super member of the fund, except where, as he said, the trustee determines that the cover is not appropriate. Mr Sainsbury's evidence was, it, was that it had been determined that it was not appropriate to provide insurance to this member because when he was delinked, a welcome call had been made to him that talked about 
him not having insurance cover in place. And on that basis, he was deemed to have opted out. The member was then in a, in a category of members who were not offered insurance as part of the transition to my super. The AMP customer advocate did not agree with the view that the member should not have been provided with insurance. Mr Sainsbury's evidence was that the trustee disagrees with the customer advocate's view and considers the decision to be appropriate and that AMP does not consider its conduct to be a breach. An ex gratia payment was ultimately made to the member. The member's complaint caused AMP to undertake an investigation into whether this issue affected other members. The evidence before the Commission was that AMP Super issued a possible breach notification to APRA and ASIC about this issue on the 4th of June of this year. APRA rejected that letter and invited a formal, bre formal breach notification from AMP Super. That notification was provided on the 10th of August 2018, which said that AMP was in the process of satisfying itself that the non-provision of insurance to 1,600 My Super members was appropriate. Mr Sainsbury told the Commission that it would take another month or two until AMP Super would, would reach a view on this matter. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that AMP may have engaged in misconduct in the following ways. First, by authorising the deduction of premiums from members' accounts where those premiums are not calculated on a statistically, are calculated on a statistically inappropriate basis. That conduct may amount to a breach of sections 52, 2B and C of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. Second, by continuing to deduct insurance premiums from deceased members' accounts since at least 2016, the trustees may have breached section 912 capital A subsection 1C of the Corporations Act and sections 29VC and 52, 2B of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. Third, by failing to notify APRA and ASIC of the continued deduction of... Whether or not it's a breach of those provisions, it's more basic than that, isn't it, Mr Costello? By what right is it deducted? How do you deduct a premium for life insurance on a life that's dead? Expired. And Mr Sainsbury in evidence accepted the fact that there was no basis by which the deduction could occur. Third... I uh, wouldn't really thought necessary to show some entitlement to take money. Yeah, go on. Third, by failing to notify APRA and ASIC of the continued deduction of premiums from deceased member accounts since at least 2016, except to the extent notified on 26 June 2018, the trustees may have breached their obligations under section 912 capital D subsection 1 capital B of the Corporations Act and section 29 capital J capital A subsection 1 of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. Fourth, by failing to ensure that there were adequate systems in place to cease deducting premiums from deceased members' accounts, the trustees may have breached section 912 capital A subsection 1A of the Corporations Act and section 52 subsection subsections 2B and C of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. Fifth, by not ensuring that at least one of its My Super members was provided with permanent incapacity benefits on an opt-out basis, AMP Superannuation Limited may have breached section 68 capital A, capital A, subsection 1A of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. Further, on the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that AMP may have engaged in conduct falling below community standards and expectations in the following respects. First, by not adequately ensuring that members were aware that they had been defaulted to an insurance rate that assumed the member smoked in circumstances where it was unlikely that the member smoked. Second, by refusing to refund premiums incorrectly charged to the member who was charged the smoker rate in circumstances where that member was not a smoker. Third, by failing to stop the deduction of premiums from deceased members' accounts in a timely way. And fourth, 
by refusing to provide insurance cover to members who hold a MySuper product. It is open to the Commissioner to find that the oh, causes... No, just go back. Fail to stop in a timely way. This is a singular event, isn't it? There's no opportunity for a uh, reasonable time to elapse. Notification of the fact. Notification of death. Yes. Payment stops. Not a case of stops some reasonable time thereafter. Stops, I would have thought. Well, we would accept that, Commissioner. I'll be told I'm looking at these things far too simply. Well, if I am, I need to be told I am. There's no dispute from council assisting as to that proposition. <laughs> That's the real worry, <laughs> Costello. <laughs> Commissioner, as to the causes of the misconduct, it is open to find that the causes of the misconduct and the conduct falling below community standards and expectations included AMP's culture and systems, which failed to promote the best interests of members in various ways, including by failing to ensure that members were provided with default insurance cover on a statistically appropriate basis, and failing to prevent the continued deduction of premiums from deceased members' accounts. Commissioner, Ms Orr will now close on the Alliance case study. Yes, Ms Orr. Commissioner, the Alliance case study concerned misleading and deceptive content that appeared on the travel insurance pages of Alliance's website between 2012 and 2018, as well as issues relating to Alliance's compliance processes, governance and culture more generally. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Michael Winter, the Chief General Manager of Retail Distribution, and Ms Laurie Callaghan, the Chief Risk Officer. Alliance Australia Insurance Limited issues general insurance products, including travel insurance products. It distributes those products through a number of channels, including through its own website and through an underwriting agency, AWP Australia Proprietary Limited. AWP also distributes travel insurance products issued by Allianz through a number of channels, including its own website and through the websites of third parties, such as airlines or travel businesses, which Allianz refers to as partners. Allianz is responsible for determining the travel insurance content on its own website and for checking that the travel insurance content of its own website and the websites of AWP and AWP's partners comply with the law. Allianz is also responsible for checking that the content of the purchase paths used by customers who buy Allianz travel insurance products from those websites comply with the law. In 2015, Allianz decided to update the look and feel of its website. At that time, Allianz had a process for approving new website content called the Document Compliance Sign-Off Process. That process was used to review the new content that was added to the website, but was not used to review the updated website as a whole before it was made accessible to the public on the 10th of December 2015. Mr Winter described this as a failure in the approach. Shortly before the updated website was made accessible to the public, an Allianz corporate solicitor identified issues with the updated website including an absence of certain legally required disclaimers. Despite this, the website was launched. Over the coming weeks, the solicitor identified further issues with the content on the website, including misleading and deceptive statements. Despite these issues, Allianz did not take down the website. In January 2016, Allianz decided to undertake a review of the website content. The corporate solicitor put together a proposal for an external law firm to review the website content by mid-February 2016 at a cost of $25,000 to $30,000. Mr Winter declined to approve this expense. As a result, the corporate solicitor spent two days a week working on the matter until the review was done. Mr Winter conceded that his decision not to approve this expense was not the right decision and conceded that this was reflective of a lack of prioritisation within Allianz of fixing the issue. 
The review ultimately took about 10 months to complete. Because of the limited resources available, the corporate solicitor prioritised the review of the home, motor, life and business insurance content. By April 2016, the review had identified a number of misleading and deceptive statements in relation to the home, motor, life and boat insurance pages of the website. These included 14 such statements in relation to home insurance, four in relation to car insurance, three in relation to life insurance and one in relation to boat insurance. Mr Winter accepted that these statements may have misled consumers and were contrary to financial services laws. In May 2016, Allianz decided not to report the incorrect and misleading content to ASIC. Mr Winter was present at the meeting of the committee that made that decision, but could not recall whether the committee considered the number or frequency of similar previous breaches as required by section 912D of the Corporations Act. He conceded that the decision not to report the matter to ASIC was the wrong decision. He also conceded that there were clear problems known to the committee at the time of this meeting with the way the DCSO process was operating and being applied within Allianz. It took until November 2016 for Allianz to complete the review of the travel insurance content and prepare an issues list and proposed rectification plan. Mr Winter told the Commission that the review took so long because Allianz had failed to allocate the appropriate resources and priority to the issue. The issues list identified numerous misleading and deceptive statements about travel insurance products on Allianz's website. Having compiled the issues list, Allianz provided it to AWP for review. Mr Winter conceded that this was an unnecessary step and told the Commission that Allianz could have just fixed the issues itself. AWP did not return the issues list to Allianz with its comments until May 2018, some 18 months later. Mr Winter said that the issues list had been the topic of discussion at 14 meetings between Allianz and AWP between July 2017 and May 2018 and conceded that Allianz had been aware of the failure to rectify these issues. He accepted that Allianz had not treated the matter as urgent. During the period between December 2015 and May 2018, the misleading and deceptive statements identified in the issues list remained on the website. During that period, Allianz did not report the matter to ASIC or even consider taking down the relevant parts of the website. Mr Winter conceded that neither Allianz nor AWP acted with any sense of urgency to fix the issue or appreciated the seriousness of the issue and that every day the website was accessible to the public, Allianz was contravening financial services laws. Mr Winter accepted that in this instance it was more important to Allianz to protect the bottom line than to stop misleading its customers. The Commission heard that at this point, given the amount of time that had passed, Allianz decided to engage an external law firm to conduct another review of the web pages and purchase paths. That review identified 39 incorrect or misleading statements on the travel insurance pages of the website and found that many of those statements had been on the website since 2012. In June this year, Allianz reported the matter to ASIC. On the 12th of June, Allianz told ASIC that the misleading and deceptive content had been on the website since December 2015. Although Allianz found out on the 21st of June 2018 that some of the misleading and deceptive statements had been on the website since July 2012, it did not inform ASIC of this fact until the 7th of September in response to a compulsory notice issued by ASIC. Allianz took down the travel insurance pages of its website on the 6th of June 2018 and disabled the direct purchase path on the 12th of June 2018. 
Although Allianz was aware by the 14th of June that there were also misleading and deceptive content in the purchase path for its partner website, partner websites, Mr Winter decided not to take down the purchase paths for those websites. During the period from December 2015 to June 2018, Allianz issued more than two million travel insurance policies. Mr Winter was not able to say how many Allianz customers were affected by the misleading and deceptive content on Allianz's website. Ms Callaghan gave evidence about issues relating to Allianz's compliance processes, governance and culture, both in connection with the misleading and deceptive content on the website and more generally. We'll return to her evidence in addressing the open findings about the causes of the misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations uh, that are available in this case study. One of the matters about which Ms Callaghan gave evidence was Allianz's breach reporting systems. In May this year, Allianz introduced a new breach review committee. Allianz also began reviewing all open compliance incidents and reassessing them to determine whether they were reportable to ASIC. As a result of that process, in 2018, Allianz has reported seven significant breaches to ASIC. Ms Callaghan Callahan said that apart from one year where Allianz had reported four significant breaches, in other years Allianz reported either no or one breach to ASIC. Ms Callaghan said that Allianz has now identified that it needs to look at all historical breaches to determine whether Allianz had an obligation to report them to ASIC. This is because the Corporate Compliance Department at Allianz could not assure itself that the Section 912D reportability requirements had been applied to all prior breaches. Ms Callaghan said that this task was underway, but she was not able to assist the Commission in identifying the number of historical breaches that are to be assessed. We turn to the available findings of misconduct in relation to Allianz. First, it is open to find that Allianz may have engaged in conduct that was misleading or deceptive and therefore amounted to misconduct in respect of each of the 39 representations in relation to travel insurance described in the table in paragraph 86 of the statement of Michael Winter dated the 24th of August 2018 each of the 14 representations in relation to home insurance described in the table in the annexure to that statement, each of the four representations in relation to motor vehicle insurance described in that annexure, each of the three representations in relation to life insurance described in that annexure, and the representation in relation to boat insurance described in that annexure. Second, it's open to find that Allianz may have contravened its obligation in section 912D of the Corporations Act and therefore engaged in misconduct by failing to report any of this misleading and deceptive conduct to ASIC as a significant breach within 10 business days. By failing to take into account each of the matters set out in section 912D1B of the Corporations Act, when deciding in May 2016 not to report the misleading and deceptive conduct to ASIC as a significant breach, by failing to report at least three of the other matters identified in the compliance update dated July 2018, which is Exhibit 6.299, to ASIC as significant breaches within 10 business days, and until the introduction of the Breach Review Committee in May 2018, failing to have in place an adequate system to assess whether compliance incidents should be reported to ASIC as significant breaches. Third, it is also open to find that Allianz may have engaged in misconduct by failing to comply with the requirement set out in Prudential Standard CPS 220 that Allianz have a designated compliance function that assists senior management in effectively managing compliance risks 
and is adequately staffed by appropriately trained and competent persons who have sufficient authority to perform their role effectively. Ms Callaghan acknowledged that Allianz had not complied with this requirement. It is open to find that Allianz engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in the following ways. First, by not taking steps to remove the relevant pages of its website from public view while it investigated the extent of the misleading representations and determined how to fix them. Second, by not being frank and open in its dealings with ASIC after it reported the misleading and deceptive travel insurance content to ASIC as a significant breach. In particular, by failing to inform ASIC of all of the similar breaches that had been identified, and having told ASIC on the 12th of June that the misleading and deceptive representations had first appeared on the website in December 2015, and having learned on the 21st of June that in fact many of the representations had first appeared in July 2012, failing to take any steps to correct its earlier representation until it provided a response to a compulsory notice on the 7th of September. Third, by seeking to manipulate the content of an independent report commissioned by Allianz for the purpose of satisfying the requirements of CPS 220 and which Allianz intended to provide to APRA. Ms Callaghan conceded that based on her review of the email correspondence, it appeared that Allianz was attempting to manipulate the content of EY's independent report to try and get one of the ratings to change. It is open to find that this misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations is attributable to at least four matters. The first is that for many years, Allianz had inadequate processes for monitoring the content of its own website and the websites of other companies that distributed its products. Ms Callaghan accepted that for many years Allianz had inadequate processes in this respect. Both Ms Callaghan and Mr Winter accepted that these issues contributed to the misleading and deceptive content remaining on the travel insurance pages of the website. Both Ms. Mr Winter and Ms Callaghan accepted that issues with Allianz's DCSO process were identified in 2015. Despite this, in 2018, Allianz continued to have problems with its DCSO process. This was evidenced by another compliance breach identified in May this year, which related to hyperlinks on a number of financial institution partner websites that were linked to the incorrect product disclosure statement. An internal audit report prepared in August this year considered the DCSO process and found that the execution of the DCSO process is ineffective in ensuring adherence with legislative and internal requirements. Ms Callaghan agreed with the findings of the report. The second matter is that for many years, Allianz has had inadequate processes for monitoring and closing compliance incidents once they have been identified. Ms Callaghan accepted that one of the causes of the misleading and deceptive content remaining on the travel insurance pages of the website was that there was insufficient oversight of the incident by corporate compliance. A report to Allianz's Risk Committee in September 2016 recorded that remediation of the incident was substantially complete and that all material errors on the website had been corrected, even though at that time the review of the travel insurance content on the website was still ongoing. Ms Callaghan accepted that for many years Allianz's processes for identifying and monitoring compliance incidents were not sufficient to deliver the compliance results that one would want. An internal audit report from September 2015 found that significant improvement was required in measuring, monitoring and reporting within Allianz and that there was no standard process to monitor and confirm that remedial actions had been implemented prior to closing reported incidents. 
Despite the critical findings made in the report, the issue was listed as a low priority. Ms Callaghan accepted that the audit report indicated that at the time, Allianz was not taking its compliance obligations seriously, particularly in relation to the remedial action necessary after a compliance incident had been identified. Monitoring and supervision remains an issue at Allianz. An internal audit report prepared in August found that the compliance plans for laws, legislation and regulations impacting product and related processes are out of date and compliance monitoring is not taking place. Ms Callaghan agreed with this finding. She said that Allianz was only at the start of addressing it. The third matter is that until July this year, Allianz had inadequate oversight of AWP. Ms Callaghan accepted that this was one of the causes of the misleading and deceptive content remaining on the travel insurance pages of the website. She observed that in 2016, an internal audit identified that Allianz's monitoring and control of its underwriting agencies was not sufficient. Although steps were taken in 2017 to address those issues across other underwriting agencies, those steps did not include AWP. Allianz's monitoring of AWP did not improve until Allianz and AWP entered into a new underwriting agreement in July this year. Ms Callaghan accepted that under the previous underwriting agreement with AWP, Allianz's oversight of AWP was inadequate. She accepted that while that underwriting agreement was in place, there were issues with AWP's compliance with its legal obligations. She accepted that AWP regarded compliance as a lower priority than other aspects of its business and that AWP's conduct created a risk that Allianz would breach its own legal obligations. Ms Callaghan said that Allianz's systems for monitoring and supervising third party distributors was a broader problem which went beyond AWP. She admitted that as well as underwriting agencies, Allianz also had problems supervising car dealers and the financial institutions selling Allianz products. Ms Callaghan gave evidence that Allianz was currently investing more in its compliance systems to improve its supervision and monitoring of third parties, but she admitted that she has not provided final sign-off as to whether the manual controls put in place are effective. The fourth matter is that Allianz's culture is one that does not consider risk and compliance as a priority and which adopts a defensive attitude when challenged about its practices. Ms Callaghan accepted that one of the causes of the misleading and deceptive content remaining on the travel insurance pages of the website was that Allianz had an insufficient appreciation of the consequences for customers of this information being on the website. She also said that this incident was an example of an instance where Allianz's management had not considered compliance to be a priority. Ms Callaghan said that prior to her time as Chief, Chief Risk Officer, Allianz had focused on technical or legal compliance rather than encouraging a culture that really looked to improve Allianz's processes. She accepted that in the past, Allianz had not devoted adequate resources to compliance. Ms Callaghan gave evidence that Allianz only reached the point at which it was fully resourced for its compliance function one week before she gave evidence. Ms Callaghan also gave evidence about the way that Allianz reacted to external reports from Ernst & Young and Deloitte about the adequacy of its risk and compliance arrangements. The Commission heard that Allianz commissioned EY to prepare two reports, a risk report and a compliance report. Allianz commissioned the risk report for the purpose of complying with CPS 220 and providing the report to APRA. After receiving draft copies of both reports, Allianz provided extensive feedback to EY in an attempt to improve the ratings given by EY in the reports. 
Ms Callaghan accepted that this was not appropriate and that Allianz was trying to influence and alter the content of a report that it was required to produce under CPS 220. EY changed the ratings in the compliance report but did not change the ratings in the risk report. In June 2018, Ms Callaghan commissioned Deloitte to prepare a report addressing the compliance incidents that Allianz had recently reported to ASIC. On receiving a highly critical draft report, Ms Callaghan's reaction was to ask Deloitte to retract the report. She agreed that this was not her finest moment and that this matter would be relevant to the risk governance written assessment that Allianz is currently preparing for submission to APRA in November. Commission, Commissioner, we want to turn to the next case study, uh, which involves IAG. Mr Costello will address you on that case study. Yes. Commissioner, this case study concerned the add-on insurance products of Swan Insurance Australia Proprietary Limited, <clears throat> a subsidiary of Insurance Australia Group Limited, which I'll refer to as IAG. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Benjamin Bessel, the Executive General Manager Business Distribution and Group Executive within the Australia Division at IAG. Mr Bessel described the relationship between IAG and SWAN as a devolved business model where SWAN was effectively a standalone business. However, the person with ultimate responsibility for SWAN was the head of the IAG division in which SWAN sat and since 2013, the CEO of IAG had been a director of SWAN. <coughs> From 2008 to 2018, SWAN sold comprehensive motor insurance and eight add-on insurance products, some of which were variations on or replacements of other products. SWAN sold these products through its authorised representatives, which included car and motorcycle dealers. In this 10-year period, SWAN sold approximately 846,000 policies through car dealerships, received approximately $1.07 billion in premiums, and paid out about 10% of that amount in claims under its add-on insurance policies. At its peak, SWAN had approximately 3,000 authorised representatives selling its products throughout Australia. Add-on insurance was a very significant part of SWAN's business. In the financial year ending 2014, auto dealers delivered 71% of SWAN's gross written premiums. SWAN sold three types of consumer credit insurance, loan protection insurance, walkaway insurance and protection plus insurance. SWAN also sold guaranteed asset protection or gap insurance, purchase price protection insurance, which was similar to gap insurance, mechanical breakdown insurance and tyre and rim insurance. SWAN's add-on insurance products were added on to the purchase of a car or motorcycle which generally occurred at the dealership. Mr Bessel acknowledged that add-on insurance products were sold to customers rather than being bought by customers and that in many circumstances the customer's decision about whether or not to buy an add-on insurance product came after a customer had chosen the vehicle and agreed the terms for finance. Swan generally engaged in authorised representative generally engaged its authorised representatives through authorised representative agreements. Under those agreements, representatives were authorised to provide general advice but not personal advice and to deal in financial products. The agreements required the authorised representatives to, among other things, comply with applicable laws and policies and any reasonable requirements or directions given by SWAN. The agreements also provided SWAN with the right to inspect the authorised representative's place of business and to conduct audits. Mr Bessel was not aware whether these clauses had been invoked, but said that SWAN regularly obtained information about and visited the premises of its authorised representatives. Under the agreements, representatives were remunerated exclusively by commission, with different rates of commission attaching to different products. The agreements usually provided for more than one commission rate for gap insurance, 
the commission increased when the customer was sold a higher level of cover. Swan also entered into incentive scheme agreements with some authorised representatives. Mr Bessel's evidence was that these agreements were offered to dealers who Swan thought could grow the business. These agreements were not uncommon in the market and were also used to ensure that Swan remained competitive. The amounts paid under the incentive scheme agreements were paid in addition to the amounts paid under the authorised representative agreement. Payments under the incentive scheme agreements were calculated based on the gross written premiums for the financial year and a factor called group product mix, which was calculated by reference to the mix of different add-on products sold. The rationale behind the group product mix factor was to incentivise dealers to sell a variety of add-on products to a single customer. Under the incentive scheme agreements, authorised representatives could also be paid a performance bonus commission and a product mix bonus, which was based on the gross written premiums of consumer credit insurance and tyre and rim insurance, because tyre and rim insurance was more difficult to sell. Mr Bessel told the Commission that the potential breach by Swan of section 145 of the National Credit Code, referred to in IAG's submission to the Commission of 29 June 2018, was likely to have been caused by the product, product mix bonus offered to some authorised representatives. Another way in which Swan incentivised sales was through the Swan Ignition Incentives Program. That program had been running since 2004 and was designed to incentivise employees of authorised representatives by providing them with points when they sold add-on insurance products. One point was equal to one dollar. The points were redeemable online and could be exchanged for particular products. At least between 2014 and 2016, Swan also ran short-term bonus programs called Supercharged Ignition, which allowed employees to accrue more points when they sold a bundle of three or four products in the same transaction. Mr Bessel said that Swan was not the only market participant which provided incentives to employees of car dealers. Mr Bessel accepted that the point of Swan's remuneration and incentive arrangements was to incentivise sales. He accepted that on occasion these incentive programs incentivised inappropriate sales practices and that Swan's authorised representatives sold products that were not appropriate to some customers. Mr Bessel accepted that Swan was heavily reliant on its dealers to maintain market share. A risk report from October 2014 recorded that Swan considered that one of its risks was competitor attacks to its dealer market resulting in reduced market share. One control identified to protect, protect against this risk was the commission and incentive arrangements between Swan and its authorised representatives. That risk report did not record any explicit consideration of Swan's customers. Mr Bessel agreed that this was at least partly because Swan viewed the dealers as its customers. Mr Bessel was aware that at all relevant times, Swan was obliged to have in place adequate arrangements for the management of conflicts of interest that may arise from the sale of its products. The arrangements that Swan had in place for that purpose were a training program and an electronic questionnaire for authorised representatives, along with the ability for employees to notify Swan of issues through a compliance mailbox. Between March 2013 and January 2017, Swan maintained a light touch approach to the monitoring of authorised representatives, due in part to the prior prioritisation of scarce resources. Mr Bessel acknowledged that as at January 2017, Swan had not responded to the changing level of risk, of risk that had arisen from the increased scrutiny of add-on products. At that time, Swan had no oversight of any issues that may be occurring because Swan's authorised representatives were not actively recording potential breaches. In addition, Swan did not undertake any monitoring to ensure that refresher training was completed nor conduct any face-to-face -face audits. Swan's electronic questionnaire was limited in the detail that it captured. Mr Bessel accepted that at least between 2013 and January 2017, 
Swan did not have in place adequate risk management systems, particularly in the light of the failure to authorise uh, for authorised representatives to actively report breaches. Mr Bessel agreed that if he were running the business today, he would not be comfortable with the level of oversight that had been in place as at January 2017. He agreed that this level of oversight would not have been considered appropriate in any year since 2013. Turning to IAG's engagement with ASIC, Mr Bessel accepted that IAG had been aware since late 2013 that ASIC had concerns with add-on insurance products and that IAG had understood since 2015 that ASIC's concerns related to product design and sales practices. However, Swan did not take any proactive steps to investigate the products or sales techniques that were of concern. By June 2015, IAG had begun engaging with ASIC through the Insurance Council of Australia. Mr Bessel accepted that, at the time, the industry had generally acknowledged that commission structures were either inappropriate or not financially competitive for product providers, but that no one was prepared to move first by reducing commissions. Mr Bessel said that in December 2018, Swan became aware that ASIC considered the sale of Swan's products through motor dealers may be contravening regulatory requirements. Despite this, in May 2016, Swan's primary concern ab about product design risks was still profit related and there was no consideration of whether the design of Swan's products adversely affected consumers. In addition, Swan continued with its remuneration incentive programs until at least June 2016. Mr Bessel accepted that Swan's maintenance of its market share would not have been possible had it uni unilaterally decreased commissions. By June 2016, IAG was aware that it had limited oversight of car dealers' sales practices in relation to add-on insurance, and it had not reviewed Swan's add-on insurance products to assess whether they provided sufficient benefit to customers. Mr Bessel attributed Swan's failure to take any proactive steps to investigate issues within its business to Swan's preference for an industry-wide approach to ASIC's concerns. Mr Bessel agreed that there had been nothing stopping Swan from participating in an industry-wide approach while also reviewing its business to ascertain whether there were any problems. From August 2016, IAG commenced negotiations with ASIC in relation to Swan's add-on insurance products. On 19 December 2017, ASIC announced that IAG would enter a remediation program. As at the date of Mr Bezel's statement, it was estimated that just over 64,000 customers would be remediated $37.1 million. Mr Bessel told the Commission that Swan was about halfway through the remediation program and expected to complete the program by the 31st of January 2019. Swan ceased distributing its products through car dealers in August 2016 and through mo motorcycle dealers in October 2017. Swan no longer sells add-on insurance products but continues to sell comprehensive motorcycle insurance. In December 2017, Swan developed product design principles applicable to its products. Mr Bessel's evidence was that if Swan's add-on insurance products were sold today, they would not meet the standards of these principles. Turning to questions about the value of add-on insurance more generally, Mr Bessel accepted that consumers were sold products that were of questionable or little value to them and that the products could have been better explained by the dealers. Mr Bessel agreed that the number and complexity of the products presented to the consumer and the various options within the products made it difficult for consumers to have a proper understanding of the products. Mr Bessel acknowledged that there were two important features of the regulatory regime which facilitated the sale of add-on insurance. First, the point of sale exception in the National Consumer Credit Protection Regulations relevant to consumer credit insurance products. And second, the ability for Australian financial service licensees to authorise representatives to provide general advice. Mr Bessel acknowledged that some industry participants considered it inappropriate 
for authorised representatives to, deter to determine whether an add-on insurance policy was suitable for the customer in circumstances where authorised representatives were authorised to provide general advice only. When asked about the proposal that add-on insurance should be only sold via a deferred sales model, Mr Bessel said that he would support such an approach. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Swan may have engaged in misconduct in the following ways. First, in circumstances where Swan undertook no meaningful review of its products to determine whether they provided any value to customers, continued to authorise the sale of those products after becoming aware that ASIC held concerns about their product design and sales practices, established and maintained arrangements that incentivise dealers to sell as many add-on products to consumers as possible, regardless of the suitability or value to consumers, and failed to establish systems to oversee and monitor the sales practices of its authorised representatives. Swan may have breached section 912 capital A subsection 1A of the Corporations Act by failing to do all things necessary to ensure that the financial services covered by its licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, by failing to establish systems to oversee and monitor the sales practices of Swan's authorised representatives, Swan may have breached section 912 capital A subsection 1 CA of the Corporations Act by failing to take reasonable steps to ensure that its representatives complied with financial services law. Third, by failing to have in place adequate arrangements for the management of any conflicts of interest that arose through incentivising sales of the add-on insurance products, Swan may have breached section 912 capital A subsection 1 double A of the Corporations Act. Fourth, Swan may have breached section 145 of the National Credit Code by authorising payments to 34 authorised representatives that may have exceeded the 20% cap on commissions imposed under that section. On the evidence, it is also open to the Commissioner to find that Swan may have engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in the following ways. First, by failing to take meaningful steps to ensure that its authorised representatives only sold out on insurance products in circumstances where the product would be of value to the customer. Second, by designing and implementing remuneration and incentive systems that promoted conflicts of interest and unfair sales practices. Third, by failing to promote sales practices that focused on delivering value to consumers and that met customer needs and expectations. Fourth, by failing to investigate the appropriateness of its add-on insurance products or the sales practices of its authorised representatives in a timely manner. Fifth, by failing to redesign the add-on insurance products and the remuneration and incentive arrangements after first becoming aware of ASIC's concerns in late 2013. It is open to the Commissioner to find that this misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations can be attributed to the remuneration and incentive arrangements Swan put in place for its authorised representatives. Those arrangements were, by design, focused solely on sales volume. The arrangements did not incentivise or promote appropriate sales. Indeed, they encouraged the inappropriate conduct that has led to the remediation program. Further, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Swan's misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations is attributable to Swan's culture in at least two respects. First, that culture placed the pursuit of profit and the maintenance of market share above the interests of its customers by designing its remuneration and incentive programs in a way that promoted inappropriate sales. Second, Swan's culture prioritised the interests of motor dealers over the interests of consumers. Mr Bessel acknowledged that Swan viewed the motor dealers, not the ultimate customer, as its customers. In its initial submission to the Commission, IAG acknowledged that Swan's focus on motor dealers was a significant contributor to the conduct that was now the subject of the remediation program. It is also open to the Commission to find that a further cause was Swan's governance practices, 
which did not properly supervise or audit the activities of its authorised representatives. And finally, it is open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct can be attributed to IAG's governance practices, which, due to the devolved business model, failed to appropriately supervise and monitor the operations of its wholly owned subsidiary, SWAN. Commissioner, uh, Ms Orr will now say something about the natural disaster case studies. Yes. Commissioner, the remaining case studies that we wish to deal with in closing concerned the conduct of two insurers, UE and AAI, in responding to claims made under home insurance policies following natural disasters and severe weather events. These case studies involved evidence from three consumers about the handling of their claims. The evidence was factually complex and we formed the view that it would be beneficial to provide our closing submissions on these case studies in writing. Could I tender those submissions, Commissioner? Uh, the document ID is RCD 0027 at 0001-0001. Written closing submissions about natural disaster case studies, RCD 0027-001-001, exhibit 6.2. Two, four, three. And Commissioner, as I indicated at the outset, we intend to publish a further document containing the questions that arise from the case studies and the other evidence tendered in the hearings uh, for submissions more broadly. And as I indicated, we'll publish that on Friday next week. Our submissions in relation to the natural disaster case studies um, we understand will be made available on the website by 6pm tonight. Yes. That, I think, is that, is it not, Ms Orr? Yes, but for the timelines that you wish yes. to fix, Commissioner, for responses, uh, both to the closing submissions that we have delivered today and which we'll deliver on the website this evening and in relation to the questions that we will publish next Friday. Well, as to... Uh, case study submissions, the position will be substantially as it was in past rounds. That is to say, uh, those who are the immediate parties to particular case studies may make uh, submissions in writing not exceeding 20 pages, and they may do that by no later than 4pm on Monday 1 October. Uh, I fix Monday 1 October in light of the fact that Friday 28 September is a public holiday in this state. Uh, though not elsewhere, I think, uh, those submissions uh, should be submitted to the solicitor assisting uh, the Commission in the uh, uh, usual way. And at the risk of repeating something that I've said, uh, I think, more than once before, uh, it's my expectation that the documents referred to in the submissions uh, about case studies would be restricted to those documents that have been tendered in the course of hearings. If for some reason a party sought to refer to a document that was not tendered, that party would need to apply to tender the document, would need to provide written submissions as to why the document was not tendered uh, during the course of the hearing. And if the application were made and granted and the document was then tendered, it would be marked as an exhibit and be published in the ordinary way. Now, you've indicated, Ms Orr, that uh, by uh, midday on that holiday, Friday 28 September, uh, you intend there should be published a document setting out the more general questions that arise from the case studies and the other evidence that has been heard. Uh, any person who wants to provide submissions about those questions, the general questions, will have until uh, midday on Friday 26 October, Friday 26 October midday, to do that. And as in relation to the fifth round of hearings, uh, I would say that 
and the submissions are not to exceed 50 pages, but uh, that is the outer limit. The submissions are to be as concise uh, as uh, they can reasonably be made. We all know the aphorism about writing a long letter because I didn't have time to write a short letter. Well, that applies to these submissions. And those submissions should be lodged with the Commission uh, through the Commission's website. That, I think, is that, is it not, Ms. Yes, Hall? Commissioner. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, we'll adjourn the Commission until 19 November next in Sydney.